This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Sorry about that, everybody. We have a naughty Puji that seems to want to just play music for some reason. Now, the best way to start a safari is with the track that is behind me, and that is of a male leopard. This is Safari Live. Ready. Standing by. Good afternoon everyone and welcome to our sunset safari from a very sunny, very bright, hot Juma game reserve. And as I was saying just now, it is the best way to get started when you have a track for a male leopard. Now my name is Tristan and on camera today I've got Senzo and we are out live from South Africa which means that we can get hold of us on hashtag safari live on Twitter or on the YouTube chat should you want to get ask any questions or get hold of us. Now I was saying that it's a male leopard track and the reason why I can tell purely is just because of the size. These are big, big, wide tracks, which is very typical of a male leopard. Now, I'm pretty sure that these are tracks for Tingana, given where we are. We're right in the southwestern parts of the reserve, and his tracks are going straight north up the road. Now, I'm not sure how fresh these tracks are. I don't think a vehicle has driven here in about three days. So these could have been from yesterday. I want to follow them a little bit further and just see if they are not on top of any of the nocturnal animals from last night, and that will give me a better indication of who it is. Now for some of you who don't know who Puji is, who interrupted our opening of the show so badly, Puji is our speaker friend and mascot that comes around with us that plays all our bird calls and various animal sounds should we need them, but he was very naughty this afternoon and decided to interrupt proceedings very quickly. So Puji has been turned off and has now been thrown into the naughty corner. For all of you that didn't see us this morning and were wondering where we may have been, well we were just off for the morning, there was no major problems, we managed to fix all of our massive mechanical issues we had yesterday so from Wendy's broken aerial which was welded so nicely by Herbie. Herbie was an absolute champion today. Herbie came to the rescue and helped us out and really gave us a big hand with welding of the aerial and then after that we replaced the steering rod as well and so Rusty as you can see is driving like a dream maybe not a dream and is pulling a little bit to the left but otherwise it's pretty straight and the steering rod is all good so we should be absolutely fine for this afternoon and hopefully we should have a very good one the sounds of it this morning was excellent our chair which I'll get into a little bit later but I believe my friend McCurdy Taylor McCurdy that is has got something very special that we don't see in Juma Hello everybody from a very sunny day here in Kenya. It is absolutely beautiful and the buffalo seem to be enjoying the wonderful weather too. They were rolling around in the mud but unfortunately they got up and left the mud. But that's okay because the hummocorp is now happy that uh, it has got its pond back and it's a hummocorp that lives here all the time. Hello everyone, my name is Taylor. This is Maurice, aka Maurice the Elephant. And on camera with me today is Ferg the Great mighty Fergus of South Africa who I haven't driven this is our first drive together in Kenya right? it is, I feel like there's a lot of pressure on my shoulders today it right is indeed. I feel you, your, cut, your clutch control has uh, improved my clutch control has improved Whew. you want me mean riding the clutch to get <laughs> the revs up in the car now remember this is live <laughs> this is interactive this is happening right now you can hashtag safari live or you can chat to us on the YouTube and it'll be great to hear from all of you today. But isn't this a, a lovely scene? Beautiful white fluffy clouds in the sky and of course the darkness of the buffalo. I wonder where they're going to go next. They look like they've been sleeping for most of the day. And it's like I said, it's been exceptionally hot. So I don't think there would have been too many animals moving around. Everyone would have been just hanging around in the shade, in the mud, doing all those wonderful things to try and keep nice and cool. Now, Jared, you're wondering if the buffalo horns are made of hair. Well, theoretically, yes, they are. It's keratin. So it's just compacted. 
um, fibers of hair and um, it creates that wonderful hard sort of shell that they have on top of their heads. Now the other day I was staring at a wildebeest and hopefully we'll see a wildebeest so I can show you this and I feel like a buffalo's horns you know sits on its head and it's in proportion to the rest of its body whereas if you look at a wildebeest it looks like they've put on a hat that's way too small for their heads it always sits on a bizarre spot but hopefully we'll find one and then I'll show you exactly what I mean and there's lots of oxpeckers also jumping about on the backs of the buffalo who have we got there you a yellow build or you a red build oxpecker you a red build oxpecker that's the first red build oxpecker I've actually seen since I've been here I've only been seeing yellow build so that's nice and if you're wondering how on earth I can tell the difference between the two we'll quickly just recap but you can see it's got a yellow well you you could have seen <laughs> oh it's just landed on the next one it has a yellow ring around its eye an orbital ring and then also its beak is completely red uh, the yellow build oxpecker is a lot more robust it's bigger than the red build oxpecker it's got quite a bit of yellow on the beak and it lacks that yellow orbital ring they're quite easy to see but if we see some more we can obviously go through the differences a little bit more closely are you guys gonna come back and wallow no uh, mr. Hummer Corp though is very very happy in its pan I can't imagine what would be living in there though other than maybe some ticks that have drowned and fallen off the buffalo but they wouldn't be living in there they'd be dying and drowning and it's more like slush and you know gunk really than water which is where you'll see frogs living in there you know you might have little and other invertebrates swimming around but that does not seem like the case I mean like you can barely see that what's left of that water rippling but who knows maybe there's the odd frog or something lurking about in the grass and that Hummercorp is waiting for it to make a grave mistake and expose itself isn't that cool right but let's carry on we're blocking a major intersection and I don't want to oh it's just it's Jamie wait let's say hello to Jamie let me reposition quickly I'm gonna block her now let's see what she's gonna think about this here we go doesn't she look so fetching with her lovely hat there's Craig sippy cup in hand oh this is Miss Africa driving towards us <laughs> give us a queen wave Jamie give us a queen wave <laughs> I'm hiding from you I was just saying that you, your new title is Miss Africa Pardon? Miss Africa Miss Africa yeah Miss Kenya oh, very look at that lovely sippy cup what's in that sippy cup Jamie <laughs> Oh, wonderful. I feel we have a lot of those, eh? Yeah. Tea and a generic saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Jerry, Jerry would be very good at doing that. Even Rebecca. Or Rebecca. Sorry. Okay. I'm watching you on the monitor. Now I could be looking at you in real life and I'm like such a habit. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy, and um, ho uh, we'll let you know if we find anything this way. Okay, cool. Bye, Craig. There's Bye. Cutthroat Craig looking dangerous. <laughs> uh, that's so funny. Here we go. Off they go. Oh no, I'm rolling, and the brakes don't work. Oh, oh, we've got to really use the clutch control. Wonderful. Well, there we go. You've seen Miss Jamie now, ready on her safari adventure. She's going to be spending most of the night out, barring the weather. Let's hope it stays nice and clear. And well, speaking of Jamie, we're not going to go very far. I'm going to send you straight across to her in the other car. Hey, very good afternoon and welcome to the Sunset Safari. Uh, my name is Jamie, in case you missed that. And this afternoon, Craig is on camera with me. And Craig and I have been talking, and Craig and I were trying to work out when last we worked together with, you know, out in the field. Not obviously on a day-to-day -day basis, but out in the field. And I think the last time was sometime around May. I'm not even entirely sure exactly when. Quick stop for the secretary bird, and then we really need to get moving. I have got a 
vast distance to travel this afternoon. We are going to go back to where Brent had the warring hyena clans this morning. What an amazing sighting that was. So we're going to head back there, but I would not, it really, it wouldn't be in an afternoon, it wouldn't be an afternoon safari with Jamie if we didn't stop for a secretary bird. It's just one of those things. I can't, I can't bring myself to drive past them. Which means Taylor's going to overtake us. Should we stop her, Craig? Ah. Drat. We're dragging. <laughs> this is a bad idea. <laughs> a bad idea. Oh. Paka. <laughs> One of us was, was going to injure ourselves doing that, and possibly everybody else on board. Plus, I, I'm not even going to try and compete with Speedy McCurdy's driving skills. And just hang back a little bit. I don't even know where she's going, really. Maybe it's the sausages. I don't know. Mm. And I apologize for the for the tea drinking. It's been one of those long days and I just I just needed a pick me up for a long night ahead. I'm excited though. Well I was excited until I saw that weather that's up ahead of us. Hmm. Kimberly, I hear a little rumor. A little bird told me, quite a loud bird in the form of Brent. He um he tells me that there's hyenas down there, there's a cheetah, they had a lion hunt and kill this morning. Unfortunately, it, it, they were struggling with gremlins, so they couldn't broadcast it. Lion caught warthog piglet, lions chased a cheetah, but the cheetah's fine, and somewhere around there. And there are about six different sets of lions. Hence, you know, why we're going that way. Ah, oh, it seems as though during the drag race, Taylor's beaten me to our next sighting. Let's jump over there, on board, with her. <laughs> we should have done a proper wheel spin and organised that dust and all sorts of wonderful things. But Jamie, I know you're going to pass me just now if you don't have a roadblock with the numerous amount of animals that we have here. Now I'm going to try and stop. Eventually, I promise I'll get there. Oh, just try to get a good view because we've got elephants coming towards us. Yeah, come on, brakes, no. We will just stop like this for now then. Ah, oh, I was hoping it was going to be our teeny tiny tot little elephant. But that, uh, we. <laughs> but um, there goes Jamie. But it does not appear to be the case at all. I think it's a different family of elephants from the group that we saw this morning. But we'll have a little look anyway. Well, maybe it is our teeny tiny little friend. But it is quite a youngster as well. This one just looks like it's a bit more coordinated on its feet. The one we were watching this morning, like I said, it looked like it had shoes on that were too big for it, the way it was frumbling about. And there it goes, swinging its trunk. Whether it's doing that on purpose or just involuntary control at that age, you never really know. Sometimes momentum takes over. Oh, this should be interesting. They have to cross this little lugger. Now, of course, it's going to be an easy task for the adults, but for the little one, it might be quite funny. There you go. See, it's not a big lugger. It's just this little drop. Hello, girl. Who are you smelling? Do you want to cross where the zebra are? You can't because it's a zebra crossing, not an elephant crossing. I don't know. She's actually just going to stop and feed. The little one's not quite ready to go down just yet. There we go, come on little one. Just gently, not able to do that in one step like mom. Oh that sometimes you gotta use your head to help you stand up. I know that feeling. Get away, fly. That's very sweet. Now Riti, wondering if I've met the new McCurdy Hurdy. There are too many McCurdy Hurdies out here to, to try and keep track. Perhaps we'll have to go back and find that herd of uh zebra, the one that had that interesting pattern on its back. Maybe we, will, we can call that the McCurdy Herdy. But if I find a herd that I can try and pick out some individuals and hang around, we will definitely try and dub a new group. But this is fantastic. And you know what I'm really excited about is these elephants are now crossing the road and they're going to go towards a herd of zebra. And there's a couple of little foals too. 
There we go. So let's see. It's something that I have seen before, and I, we were actually talking about it the other day, is how little elephants and little rhinos and other little animals like to chase each other around. Shame that little one keeps falling to its knees, going up and down the little hills. And there's a tiny little fold that you'll see just to the left of mom. It's going to pop into this frame now. Are you going to come and play? No, the zebra looks like it's taking a wide berth. Now there's the little one. Off it goes. Actually, you've, um, no, I don't know what you've just said. Atlas, please, can you say that again? I was too busy listening to the sound of my own voice. And I forgot the question. <laughs> the comment, rather. Off they go. Huh? Alice, are you still there? <laughs> Can I? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Ashley. I missed what you said there, but um, there was something about the elephants. Oh, yes, you said they're so uncoordinated and wrinkly. There we go. That's exactly, that's a perfect way to describe a young elephant calf. But we'll keep moving on. We might pop past the sausage tree prior to have a look and see what they're up to. And... Tristan has been walking about searching for leopards. He's back in the car. Let's go across to him. Now, can you hear me now, Lou? Hello, hello, hello. Maybe you guys can hear me. I don't know. Can you hear me? Ah, there we go. I can be heard again. So, just got to iron out some of the technical glitches from yesterday. It seems as though the gremlins are still around and still busy attacking us. But as I was saying, is that we are looking for some sausages on our, of our own. Well, one particular sausage, and that is Tingana. Tingana out here, he always reminds me of a sausage because he's got this Then these short little legs, and he kind of has this sausage appearance with a tail and legs. Oh. I don't know what's going on with my audio today, but maybe there's a little issue. So hopefully it will decide to stable itself up and we won't have an issue any further. But his tracks are going slowly west, so I'm pretty sure that I am going to find his tracks crossing into Arethusa. I don't think we're going to find him here, unfortunately. Although I don't see them coming out in this area. What generally happens is he moves quite a bit, and, and the guys said that they haven't had any signs. Oh. Can you not hear me, Senzo? Cutting. Oh, goodness. What's going on with my mic pack? There we go. Like, hopefully it will be okay now. Well, I'm hoping so, at least. Is that better, Senzo? There we go. So Senzo is giving me the thumbs up, which is good news. So as I was saying, he generally likes to head kind of towards Red Dam from this side of the world. It's very seldom that we see him going north from here. So I'm pretty sure he's gone towards Red Dam and onto Arethusa. That's why I'm just driving along Impala Plains Road to see if his tracks come out. But what he could have done is just cut straight from where we had his tracks, straight westwards towards Triple M and then over that way. I don't think that he's still on this side. I might be wrong. You know our last minute leopard. He can go in all kinds of different ways, but I'm pretty sure he must be on the western side of Triple M, unfortunately, which is not going to be good. Now, in terms of, I was saying earlier that we've had a, there was a busy, uh, so we've had a busy morning, well, they had a busy morning out here this morning, those that were on game drive, and it sounds like there were wild dogs in Biffle's Hook, and in fact, not just one pair, but there was two pairs, or two packs, should I say, and the packs then went after one another and there was a massive fight between the two packs of wild dogs on Biffle's Hook which sent dogs scattering and apparently it was a pack of nine and a pack of thirteen so I'd imagine the Investex were involved there and maybe that breakaway pack from um, Hamilton's that they call the Hamilton's breakaway pack that which is originally from the Investec pack itself so I think those two came to blows this morning it also sounded like our old man in Vula unfortunately almost met his end last night given that he was apparently cornered up in a tree and where the Inkahuma lioness is and, and you guessed it which one it was amber eyes that decided to go up there with 
Mvula and tried to have a little go at him and uh, cornered him into a thicket on the edge of the tree which then led to him having to jump over two lionesses in the tree who tried to bite him as he went over and luckily he got onto a branch and managed to hold on and didn't fall to the rest of the pride at the bottom and then scampered up into the, the reaches and the lionesses stole his impala kill and off, he went, off they went and he managed to then get away so pretty crazy nonetheless. Right, well I'm going to try and see for further signs of Tingana. While I do that, I believe Taylor Mac has now got a secretary bird. So we actually stopped amongst the elephant and the zebra and the topi to have a look at a secretary bird. And the reason why we stopped here is it seems to be doing a very good job at catching things. Now, not anything significant uh, right now, but look at, look at that. It's getting insects. So even though it's such a tall bird and quite a large bird and takes on things like snakes, for a little grasshopper, when it sees it, it still uses the same technique. It stomps it flat on the ground, killing it and then devouring it. Now, I really hope that we get to watch a secretary bird catch a snake live because that is just one of the most fascinating things I have ever seen. And I have not seen it for a very long time either. And it could be very, very educational. But it just amazes me. Uh, and the reason why I actually stopped here, one of the other reasons, was um, the fact that that secretary bird was as tall as the smallest zebra foal, who was here a minute ago. It's now disappeared. We'll show it to you in a little bit. It was taller than the, the little zebra. And I just thought, wow, that's absolutely incredible. It was an amazing comparison. Now, Yvette, you're wondering if secretary birds are only found in Africa. Ooh, where are you running to? Um, I haven't, I didn't see them while I was in Australia, and I definitely didn't see them in the States. Well, I didn't travel the States too much. I would suspect that they are um, in, just in Africa. I haven't ever heard of a, another species of the secretary bird, but I do stand under correction there, Yvette. They really are amazing birds. And so you see what it's doing now? It's trying a different technique, like what we see the starlings do and um, the drongos is moving around herds of animals and hoping that something gets flushed out and a snake would definitely move away from the foot of an elephant or even a rodent would come charging out and that would be a perfect opportunity so lots of different birds use that techniques we we even see um lots of no what was i trying to say you'll see it with water birds too you know, moving around animals that are in the water. Hummercorps do it, hoping that a frog or a fish or a crab or something like that. Right. I'm just going to very quickly watch these zebra. So they seem very relaxed. I'm just going to drive on very slowly as we watch a zebra on the left. Oh, beautiful. I wonder where they're off to. And it's just amazing how all the... Uh, all the herds have um, just disappeared completely. Isn't this wonderful? Run. Oh, okay. Can you go ag again with that, Alice? Sorry. had my sunglasses on the sun is really bright I'm so sorry Alice I keep missing missing you Ferg was Ferg was reprimanding me for having my sunglasses on thank you Ferg I actually deserve a hiding for that hey? <laughs> my mom would probably yank me and go hey behave yeah so like I said we always put our sunglasses on in between and I completely forgot to take the off. apologies for that now but I look very cool like a rock star <laughs> we'll whistle from the back. Thanks, Berg. So, <laughs> oh no. Right, so we're going to just keep driving around here. Like I said, we're going to head towards the sausage street pride. No? Tristan, we're not going to Tristan now. Gremlins have got him. We'll just keep driving about. So, we're basically just going to head down there. So, we'll go over the bridge. We'll take the road that runs along this river line. We know there's plenty of things that could be there and also just scanning around us. It's important as you drive, not just to focus on the road. Luckily the roads are in fairly good nick 
on this side and they're quite wide most of the time and then when you head to the grassy tracks you know your tires just sort of stay in the ruts so it does give you an opportunity to scan around the thing that i'm struggling with most and i don't know if the other presenters feel it is normally at about seven o'clock my shoulder starts to get an automatic pain in it my right shoulder from holding the spotlight which is so funny um, <laughs> it gets used to you get so used to it but I, I really it's hard to multitask trying to spot animals and use the thermal camera to see what's going on and trying to talk on the radio and also trying to not get stuck it's easier when it's dry but um, the other night I actually had to ask David to spot for me I think I told you this because I was too scared that I was gonna roll the car because we were slipping and sliding too much I could not handle all that pressure I haven't seen any cars hanging up in the area where we last saw the sausage tree line so I don't know if they're maybe fast asleep and no one's interested in going to them it's okay we'll go and have a little look around maybe we'll find those rhinos again today wouldn't that be quite nice so after we followed up on the sausage tree pride lines just to get an idea what they're doing and where they are maybe we'll go and explore and uh, search for the rhinoceros which could be quite nice. I've enjoyed spending so much time with them and of course putting them up on screen. Now Rita, you're wondering why they're called the Sausage Tree Pride? I would assume it would be something like the Nkuhumas. You know, we know Nkuhuma means brown ivory and that's the tree that they were spotted under. So maybe it was a similar thing. There are quite a few prominent sausage trees in the area in their sort of territory so I, I would assume that that's where their name would come from is it maybe it's one of their favorite trees to lay beneath oh what's going on over here you get a better view it looks like we've got sparring giraffe perhaps but we'll know in just a moment what i'll do is there's a little road that jumps off to the right i'll i'll jump on that either that or they've got their bums super glued together i know all about that Okay, are you ready to see giraffe? Cool, have a look here very quickly. We've got a two giraffe. Now, the way that I've unfortunately parked, I can't show you now how the bottoms are, are glued together and that's such a typical stance when young males are sparring. As they normally will touch their rear ends together and then you can see that and stand at sort of a V shape to one another Oh, there we go and then well use your neck to swing around and hit the other giraffe but they're both very young you can see there's a huge age difference of a couple of years obviously the one that's looking at us now being the older one and this cheeky one <laughs> who is playing around much younger and obviously uh, quite frisky and has lots and lots of energy. But it's important. We know how important play fighting is for animals in order for them to start developing, strengthening muscles. Oh, and Izzy, you were actually hoping to see a giraffe neck fight. Well, I don't think this is going to escalate to a point where, uh, you know, they're going after females. This is just young boys. Um, <clears throat> And they're just the young boys playing around. I mean, you can see it's not anything serious. They're quite gentle about it. In fact, they stop. They have a little look around at us. And um, and then that's really all. They're looking at all of you now. Do you want to ask a question, giraffe? No. I'm going to go back to sparring. That's fine. That's what giraffe do best, I suppose. But yeah, this is really, really wonderful. I haven't seen it for a while. The last time that I saw it, I was at Juma, in fact. And we had an amazing sighting. Maybe some of you remember it. Well, my favorite one was we must have had about th was it three or four giraffe, young males, all standing with one another and, and sparring and swinging necks. It was a pretzel of a giraffe. Maybe you remember and you've got screenshots. Ah, Fluizi, who is all the way in Juma, says that she remembers. It was a really fantastic sighting. It was in the Muluati. Actually, it was a lovely day. It might have been even a rehearsal for, for TV. So, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think that could have been what it was. But they're a beautiful color, aren't they? I love how their heads are so much lighter than the rest of their bodies and their undersides. Now, 
Riti, thank you for all your questions today. And if you'd like to ask questions, just as Riti has, remember you can hashtag Safari Live or chat to us on YouTube. And it was another question about the giraffe, and it was, does the spot pattern or the, the spot size and color help age a giraffe? I suppose it's hard to really say. Definitely color of the entire giraffe, because remember, as male giraffe get older, they start to produce a lot more testosterone, which then uh, enhances their colors. I mean, in the Sabi sand, we've seen a couple of males who are almost completely black, you know, really incredible. And I haven't seen a very mature bull uh, just yet, uh, the Maasai giraffe, so I'll keep an eye out. So I want to see if they go as dark as the southern giraffe, which is the species we get in South Africa. Uh, in terms of spot size, of course, like anything... They, they'll they stretch as they get older, so they start off quite compact. <laughs> Look at this, they're really adamant, aren't you? <laughs> this is so funny. I mean, it's not really so, it's actually more like a massage. He's probably saying, come on, Frank, I told you, right shoulder, near the wither, on the neck, work that area. <laughs> I don't know if that's what the thing that a giraffe would say. Anyways, we're going to carry on with our search, though, and go and find the lions because I'm excited to see what they're up to. Tristan has arrived at Twin Dams. I wonder if he's got a spotted surprise yet. Well, <laughs> I'm not quite at Twin Dams yet. I'm on Twin Dams Road, but not at Twin Dams. In fact, I'm still very far from Twin Dams at this stage. I'm right on the northern side of the road because we did a loop round to check if there was any sign of Tingana coming further north which there wasn't except that there was a track for a male leopard going north pretty f close if you drew a straight line from where I had those tracks crossing into Buffalo's Hook so I think it might be his tracks I might have just missed where they cut off and have then since gone northwards towards Buffalo's Hook side so I'm not 100% convinced he's still here I asked the guys if anyone drove there this morning they said no so those tracks could very well be from last night there was one or two little insects on top from during the day so things like ant lines that are active during the day quite a lot there was one ant line on top and there was also a water buck track that was over the top of it so I'm not 100% convinced that it was very fresh and I think they might have been from last night and they might have headed a little further north and into Buffalo's Hook maybe he heard the commotion with Mvula and the rest and went to go and investigate because those tracks go directly towards that area where the Nkumas and Mvula had that little showdown but they came from sort of Juma's side so I suppose it's very possible that he went that way so now we're just meandering our way along the Mulawati I want to just go slowly see if there's any signs of Tumba last night when we had our steering rod incident and we got stuck in the Mulawati we had a hyena that came to join us and I actually wanted to ask some of our hyena experts that are around that watch the show whether or not they know who a hyena is with half a right ear because there was a hyena that joined us, quite a big hyena that had half a right ear, quite ginger in color and looked to be on the older side of life. So it came and sat near us for a while and just watched us going about our business working on the car or underneath the car and then Tumba was around. We could hear alarm calls of a lot of birds and various other things and he seemed as though he just carried on slowly northwards up the Mulawati drainage line so I think he must be still around somewhere as well. <laughs> Justin, you want to know how much of Rusty is still original given how many parts have been replaced on him? Well, I'm not sure to be honest, probably not very much. Maybe the dashboard and the bodywork to a degree, I think maybe even some of the bodywork has been changed and, and redone, so I'm not sure there are too many original parts for Rusty, but he still goes strong and he's still a powerful car. I mean, we were talking about it yesterday with Senza when we were busy with the car and you know, lots of conversation comes up when you're stuck for an hour and you're trying to straighten a steering rod by hand and it all gets a little frustrating at times and so you start talking about all kinds of random things to keep yourself entertained while you're underneath it. And we came up with the fact that Senzo was commenting on how Wendy struggled to get up a little bank in the Milawati and just couldn't do it, whereas Rusty was not even an effort for Rusty. We just kind of put the foot down and it just goes whoop, up onto the top. So Rusty seems to be a lot more powerful than what Wendy is, but is prone to bending a steering arms. Now the reason why he bends steering arms is because there's a bracket that's supposed to hold the steering 
cutting arm underneath. That unfortunately was knocked off and I'm not sure who, I don't want to point fingers, but somebody indicated that it might have been in a wild dog chase, so I'm not going to say who that was, but I'm pretty sure you can all work out exactly who it was. Now, there is a, no, don't run away. You behave yourself and stay there. So there is a warthog that is just in the shady section of those quarries, and the warthogs in this area sometimes are a little bit shy. You can see starting to just trot off. It looks like a young male, or could be a female. Is it a female? Difficult to say now that it's gone behind. I didn't get a good look at the warts on the face or at the area underneath the tail before it decided to turn tail and move away from us and go and camouflage underneath the trees. So I'm not sure who it is. No, it looks like a female. So she's a rather large girl and I'm sure this must be then the mother of some of the piglets that we see in this area because we generally see a female with piglets around Chelapan and I wouldn't be surprised that it's her and she's just rooting around in the shady section around the pan and trying to find a little bit of comfort from the heat. She'll have to be careful though if she's got little ones anywhere nearby. Tumba has been lurking around here for days and so he would love I'm sure a little warthog piglet and so she's gonna have to be a little bit careful. Also this time of the year a lot of the warthogs are pregnant which makes them a little bit more vulnerable because unfortunately when the ladies get pregnant out here or the females of the varying species they tend to unfortunately get a little slower and so slower means that the predators will try and take advantage and try and hunt them and I'm Lou says I must be careful and I don't mean it's in any disrespect whatsoever it's not their fault they unfortunately are carrying a whole bunch more and in the case of warthogs sometimes can be carrying eight little piglets inside there so it's a lot of extra weight and it means that they just can't be as agile as they would be on a normal basis and the predators know this and they'll actively target pregnant individuals at this time of the year you'll find that they'll go after pregnant impalas, pregnant warthogs, zebras, buffalo whatever the case may be depending on the species that's being hunted and they actually have a lot more success and it's one of the reasons why we get an even sort of killing if you want to call it of the different sexes out here is because this pregnancy period a lot of the females are hunting but when it's mating period because the males are so hyped up on testosterone and so into trying to mate they don't watch for predators and then you get a situation where they will actually be killed and so males and females are, are killed at different times of the year which is which is very interesting so it helps just to maintain that balance in terms of numbers and then of course when young ones are born then it's just any young one is killed and it's a 50-50 lottery as to whether they're male or female. Right, now let's get in. Exactly, it is like a Predator KFC box meal. Crystal, you say you don't know about half a right ear, but you know that there was a male with a scar and a half a left ear, but I'm pretty sure that this had half a right ear. Since was it half a right or half a left? I'm sure it was half a right. I don't know. We'll have to. I'll have to look. I'm sure we got some footage of it, and we'll try and have a check. But I'm pretty sure it was half a right ear, and it looked to me like a female, an older female. But I might be wrong altogether. I might have this completely mixed up in the sort of semi darkness that we were sitting in. It might have been left, and my brain has just been kind of fooling me but I'm sure it was on the right side I think back now even I think that it was on the right hand side I know we saw a hyena briefly 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 while I was still live and I think it's the same hyena so maybe if we go back and have a little look at that hyena we'll be able to work out who exactly this is and which hyena it is but thank you Crystal though for helping and trying to decode the mystery that was our hyena friend and company last night certainly was very very calm and very placid and in no way gave us any trouble whatsoever just watched what was going on and was curious so banging and trying of humans underneath a car to try and fix things I'm sure it was just curious as to what is going on also with all the alarm calls that kind of distracted it quite quickly as soon as we heard birds and stuff that hyena was up and down looking around I'm sure it was trying to track down Tumba in the hope that maybe just maybe there was a meal for it somewhere around Twin Dams. At the end of the day, there must be so much scent from leopard around Twin Dams over the last week because we've seen leopards there. It's not every day, but pretty much every day there's been some sort of a sign of a leopard in and around Twin Dams. And so I'm pretty sure the hyenas are getting quite used to that smell and maybe think that there is something going on with all the alarm calls that keep taking place in that area. And that's maybe what's attracting them to that section and why they were roaming around there yesterday afternoon. But no tr further tracks 
for any leopard or anything like that so far. Buttons, unfortunately not. The buffalo herds have not come to Juma yet. They keep going to Sydney's Dam and apparently this morning they were at Sydney's Dam and we would have been able to get a view of them but then this afternoon they apparently as we got going the guys gave me a report that they're back into the Mandaleti slowly drifting away from Sydney's Dam and all they could see was two males that were left behind and were slowly also on their way that side so by the time I would have got there unfortunately they would have been gone so the buffalo are proving to be a bit of a pain as well they must decide to come south not that we really have much water for a really big herd of buffalo if a big herd of buffalo had to arrive at Gauri Dam or even um, Twin Dams I suppose is the only one but Treehouse Dam that would be too small for a big herd and they would end up drinking a lot of it and muddying it up and it would really take a pounding our water holes so I think in a way it's a bit of a godsend I know we want to see buffalo and we want to have them around because obviously the Inkahumas will probably spend more time but at this stage there is really um, no, no real reason for them to come here because there's not exactly that much water and not exactly that much grazing either to deal with. So we're just going to go up onto the bank here to allow another vehicle to go past. Are you all? Hello, everybody. There we go. Just have to greet all our neighbours and see what they've been up to and what's been happening and whether or not they've seen anything, which they haven't, as I spoke to them on the radio just now. But it's also just good to greet people and to see and to say hello. I wonder if our Franklin will stay there. There's a beautiful Natal Franklin that might or might not stay. No, it's decided to jump down, so it's going to just trot about in the long grass, and of course it's going to try and hide itself now. I think just to the right of the tree sensor. There it is. You can just see it in the background. It's head bobbing and it's doing its best camouflage possible. It should come out shortly. There it comes. There's a beautiful Natal Franklin. They have that pretty drab coloration and a bright orangey beak and legs and quite easy to identify. And there's a group of them that hang around a lot in this particular section and they've tormented Tumba many times from here by squawking at him and running around all over the place and making a lot of noise and so it's the usual grouping I don't know where all its friends are there's normally a couple more than just this one right well Franklin's disappeared onward towards treehouse I mean twin dams we go I don't know if that vehicle checked twin dams they hadn't when I last spoke to them but maybe just maybe we'll go and check there I believe Hosanna was there this morning so that's why we're heading in that direction but I don't think he's still there this afternoon by the sounds of things and we need him to come out because well we want to carry on our cat streak oh, come on Rusty come on come on there we go so just got to get Rusty's revs up a little bit otherwise he decides to just stall so hopefully he's still around there maybe with the heat he just found himself some shade to lie down in and to rest and relax so I'll head back towards the twin dams again and just have a double check maybe that vehicle for oh there's another vehicle I think everybody's had the same idea to check around this section and this area so I believe that my friend Jamie is also out and about no Rusty doesn't want to go up the bank and she is driving into a storm so while I get myself out of this mess that is the sand she can get herself into the mess that is a big rainstorm a distressing smell emanating from Mila's tires I've got a horrible feeling I've driven through a nice pile of lion scat it really is distinctly stinky oh. I should never have said to Taylor the weather looks okay. That was a grievous error on my part. That was just inviting trouble. So we're still racing along. We didn't quite get as far as I'd hoped, as quickly as I'd hoped, because we bumped into some viewers from Nevada and they were just telling us about the amazing holiday that they've had. They've been to Amicelli, they've spent a whole load of time here in the Mara. Sounds like they've had a fantastic time. trying to work out which way the rain's blowing. We think it's blowing away from us. Elana, who I know is very interested in trees and identifying grasses and those sorts of things. Elana, there are a few grasses that animals don't like to eat. 
So basically the way that the that grass is, is classified is in terms of its palatability and the way that it responds to grazing. And what you'll find usually, not always, um, this is a slightly different ecosystem, but usually around damaged areas. So things like next to roads, um, in very highly eroded areas where there's been a lot of damage, a lot of overgrazing, to the point that the, the grass balance has been, has been damaged. Essentially what you get is what are known as pioneer species of grass. So pioneer species of grass is a very hardy type of grass that is able to grow in conditions that are quite difficult. So that makes sense. What you get then is a succession. You get your pioneer species and the pioneer species starts to hold the soil together. When it dies, it adds nutrients. The root systems will stop water from washing the soil away. And slowly but surely, you get a better layer of soil. And then you get your next set of grasses, and then you get what's known as the climax set of grasses. And that's stuff like your, um, like your red grass or the red oat grass that we see here. So that's stuff that is really very nutritious for the animals to eat. But when you've got the pioneer species, then you're talking about things like um, carrot spikethorn is one example. Turpentine grass is another. Turpentine grass is called turpentine grass because it smells like turpentine when you rub the seeds. Um, Natal red top is also one example of a, a grass that the animals do eat it, they can eat it, but it's not particularly nice for them. And it's not, it's not as nutritious as something like the red grass. Obviously, if you're in a complete drought and there's no, there's no other options, the animals will eat those grasses, but they won't particularly enjoy it. So grasses are a complex, a complex thing. I wish I had more time to actually learn about them. I really like grass. Of course, we're driving along bare sand on one of the main roads, but a lot of the roads are almost invisible in the grass here. It sounds like Taylor's found one. We're actually off-road. I thought it was so grassy, but uh, I suspect that this track was maybe created from this morning's vehicles going up and down. It doesn't look particularly prominent, and with, well, of course, with the ground being wet first thing in the morning, and driving I mean, five or six cars and who knows how many more cars came after we left to the sighting it definitely makes it track but we're coming onto a proper track now so i don't know where our lions have gone the carpet is completely finished there's just skin that's left of that zebra the vultures obviously got to it they must have abandoned their kill and off they went but now we need to try and figure out where exactly they've gone let me, I have to just check with my binoculars. Let me just check up on this hill. I think they might have gone to their favorite hill, which is this one that's coming up to... Ooh, hello. Hello, first gear low range. <laughs> Forget about that, and then you zoom on off. So, there was a question from Odie Farming about my favorite sighting in Australia. Um, I'm hoping to actually head to Australia on not this leave now, but my following one. Uh, to go back home again I think that would be quite nice um, and my favorite sighting it's a hard one to tell like it's an unusual one so it was basically I went for a walk with one of my uncle's dogs I went down to the stables to feed the horses and and take pictures of just everything and on my way up there was, there's this one area it's quite on the house was on quite a steep hill and there's this sort of flattened out but halfway between the stables and his house. but I kid you not though the hill is like this and it's beautiful and there's a hollywood sign from an event i think it was a birthday party or an engagement party i forget now exactly what the event was and they had this holly white hollywood sign made and it's beautiful and on my way up i actually took pictures of it there were some kangaroos that were standing around the hollywood sign and i thought that was really funny to see in australia kangaroos but the hollywood sign in the background so that was my favorite sighting maybe not what you were expecting um i saw a koala in the wild though that was quite nice, very cool, and quite unusual. Hey? For my future? Mm. <laughs> Hollywood and the kangaroos. And then, and then I saw an echidna, two running across the road, and made my mom stop the car. She said, stop, 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 stop. She thought, she, I don't actually know what she thought, she slammed on brakes. 
far quicker than she should have. Um, and then I got, of course, ran down the road and everyone was asking me what was wrong. And I was like, Mikidna, you know, like crazy tourist. Me. <laughs> Anyways, we're going to go all the way to the Sabi Sand now where Tristan, I don't know what Tristan has, but I know he's looking for leopards and he is the rock star in finding leopards. So. Well, we're still trying, Taylor, and I don't know if a rock star is the right thing to say. We just get lucky sometimes and we find these things. I was trying to check the Mulawati quite carefully because Hosanna was seen at Tundams this morning. Apparently he's not there now and so I'm trying to work out where exactly he went. There's lots and lots of tracks of baboons in the area and so they might have just chased him and I'm hoping that they haven't chased him south. So I'm trying to check the southern boundary now just to make sure he hasn't gone over into Little Gauri and that we're not going to waste our time if we do find his tracks at the dam. But there are tracks in the Mulawati coming to this eastern side and that's why I want to just check here quickly and just have a double sort of glance in this area because I know sometimes our male leopards like to cross from Leadwood onto Little Gauri which is this road right here in front of us. So I'm just driving along just checking on the right hand side because this road is so busy unfortunately the tracks often get hit by cars and you don't see much but if you look on the right hand side of the road it's quite sandy and quite sort of puffy and so if he crossed I'll find his tracks on the right side which it doesn't look like has happened. We also should then see obviously tracks here of him crossing which there isn't either so that's good news for us it means that he's probably still somewhere around here maybe with the baboons he just pushed off and went and lay in another thicket somewhere to try and just get it out of this hot sun and is still somewhere in this area and maybe later in the afternoon he's going to make his way back towards the dam itself now I'm hoping that there's going to be some little dwarf mongoose that are going to pop out. They, I can hear them just calling on my left hand side, but they still at this stage are a little bit obscured. There's one there, I don't know if you can see it, Senzo, just its tail sticking out on the edge of that fallen over tree. There it's coming, it's slowly starting to come out now. So it looks like quite a young one, it doesn't look like an old mongoose at all. Of course now it will disappear down the bank because we want to show it. It's running around on the road now as well and these are our smallest carnivores so while we are tracking leopards at least we found some sort of carnivore out here it's the littlest carnivore that we have that's on land of course there are small bats that are also considered I suppose carnivorous although they are more insectivorous than anything else so they really are cool little animals and we see quite a lot of them luckily we get a lot of dwarf mongoose they tend to be a far more curious animal and far more sort of involved animal than what we see with the banded mongoose which is also in this particular section. Banded mongoose are quite a common occurrence for us. I just wanted to check this road as well, no nothing there. So we do get banded mongoose but they tend to be very shy and very secretive in comparison to these guys. These guys you, you stop and they get quite curious and then they come running out to see what you are and what you're doing and who you are and whether you are something that they can either feed off, attack or just make friends with and watch and be amazed by. So they're pretty cool little animals, quite interactive. Liss, you're wondering which of the smaller animals am I excited to see return with the warmer weather? Whew. I'm not sure actually. I, today I was, funny enough, I was going through that new book that I've gotten which is the, the invertebrate tracking book and I was going through there and there were so many insects that I was remembering and, and getting excited about that we're going to see. We've got uh, butterflies and the snails come back and the millipedes and all kinds of sort of insects that are going to arrive. So in a way I was super excited about that but I think for me, the ones that I prefer the most are probably the woodland kingfisher. That's the one that I really want to return now. The woodland kingfishers are such beautiful birds and they bring a bit of chirp and life to our days. Of course, they, their call does get a bit much towards the end of summer when you've heard it for about the four millionth time. But they are bright and colorful and they're everywhere and they make a bit of noise and they have a bit of vibrance to them. So I will enjoy them. The European rollers um, also is always a nice one to see. So I think the birds are more than anything else the migratory birds but I will look forward to seeing a lot more insects and spiders and those kind of things it certainly makes bushwalk a lot 
more fun and easy to kind of go through and see all of these different types of insects that we get in these places so I think insects and birds it's difficult to narrow down just one I'm pretty excited for all of them to come back it's going to change this whole area and it makes it a lot nicer to be out here of course at night not so much when the insects are flying around your food and various other things you know, what is with all the animals today I don't know why every time I'm stopped an animal has disappeared and tried to walk behind me but Senzo we can try and see if this Nyala is going to come through the gap it looks like it might come through on my left hand side although now it's changing direction again and hiding directly behind a quarry bush so there is a beautiful male Nyala and every single animal we've tried to show has turned and gone past now would you believe it I completely missed a massive animal that is standing right in front of me as well so don't worry about the Nyala that's disappeared in front of us here, if you can spot it, I don't know if any of you can, but there is a giraffe. And you shall see it when it pops its head up. It's going to come out onto the road. So there it is over there. It camouflage is ridiculously good. When it bends over behind the trees that I have in front of me, I can hardly see this giraffe. So a beautiful female giraffe, which means that there should be a couple others. There's been lots of tracks for giraffe up and down the Mulawati riverbed. So I would imagine there's more than just one. Let's try and catch up with it because it's moving away from us a little bit. So it seems like it's going to be a giraffe afternoon from Taylor's sparring boys to our female giraffe on this side of the world and it's been a while since I've actually seen giraffe so quite a nice pleasant surprise Romit you're wondering how tall is a fully grown healthy giraffe well it depends whether it's male or female so a female is about four and a half meters tall and a male five and a half meters tall nine feet I think it's about 27 feet if I'm right somewhere around there um, is about the height for a fully grown giraffe they all get very very big this is a quite a young female she's not very big at all still quite low to the ground so I'm surprised that she's on her own I would expect a female that's young like this to still be some more adult figures maybe they are around and they just hidden behind all this foliage and it's why we missed her as well but she's probably I would say not even fully grown so maybe five six years old you can see her ears are absolutely perfect there's not too much scarring on her coat so she's still a young individual and is only going to get bigger from here what we can see which is quite nice is if you look just in the crease of her legs there so between her leg and her body if we just go in there that's it thanks Enzo you notice there's a whole bunch of black dots now those black dots unfortunately are ticks imagine having that many ticks on your coat it must be seriously seriously uncomfortable and we normally can't really see it because you can see that's in the folds of the basically what would be equivalent of our armpit and so those ticks get in there because the heat builds up there and it's a great place to be able to access um, the skin it's also where the, the leg rubs and so this, the fur is not as thick there and they can then get in and start feeding off the blood of this animal so that will drive her crazy and it's why oxpeckers are so prevalent on giraffe because they do have a number of parasites being such big animals you'll find a situation that their parasite load or their tick load is quite a lot higher than some of the other animals we get out here and so oxpeckers are vitally important for giraffe to be able to get rid of those but it must be seriously uncomfortable that many ticks you can just imagine the itch that is taking place and she seems otherwise to be healthy she doesn't have ticks down her legs which is a good sign if when you find giraffe getting ticks all down their legs and black dots everywhere then you'll know that they're in a bit of bad shape and then they can actually die from a infection basically of the blood from an overload of ticks so she's not too bad she's just got a few around that folded skin section and so she'll be perfectly fine Our beard, you say it's amazing how big animals like this disappear behind bushes. And they do. It's, it is incredible, our beard. You, you've been here, so you'll know exactly how, what we mean. Even though on camera we sometimes battle to see them, but in real life it's also incredible how quickly they can just hide in plain sight. And this giraffe, I honestly had no idea it was here until it stepped out into a clearing and made a bit of noise, and that's what drew my attention to it. But look at its beautiful big eyelashes sorry I'm jumping around on my topic here but those eyelashes are silhouetted against the background so it's quite nice to actually see how long they are I'm sure many ladies would be very envious of those lashes and certainly a feature of giraffe you find that they do have nice long eyelashes that are nicely turned up and Lou is envious and I would imagine Megan will be too and lots of other people at home 
home. Now, the reason why they have long eyelashes is not to look beautiful. Uh, apparently, Megan has nice eyelashes, according to Lou. So, Megan's not too envious. But there is a reason for long eyelashes like this. It's not like us as people. That is to show the beautiful eyes and to try and get the boys to notice them. It is more for protection of the eyes. So, those long eyelashes keep a lot of dust out. They also stop thorns and various other things from penetrating towards the eye and causing blindness. So, they're a very, very important part. And we know giraffe do feed consistently of quite thorny trees and so those eyelashes are very very needed in order to keep eyes in good condition and you can see the ox peckers I was talking about a little bit earlier there is one there on the neck a beau there's the ox peckers right there so you're wondering where the ox peckers are to help with the ticks there is one right there going combing through the fur ever so diligently looking for any little parasites and there was another one which got shaken off by the movement of the giraffe's neck, oh, there it is, there's actually another one down lower towards the neck area, so there's two of them there, which is quite nice, and I think there's a third one on the other side as well that I saw disappear just now, so there are a few of them, and they are busy doing their thing and, and cleaning up and making sure this female is looking at her best, and making sure that she's also healthy and not covered in parasites. You'll often find with giraffe though they're actually pretty good at keeping parasites off outside of the ox peckers. They'll walk over trees and branches and scrape as many of those as they can um, and when they injured is when you notice a really big incline in the tick population on a giraffe. It's, it's almost like they get this sort of injury on their legs and they can't no longer try and rub those ticks off and the, the parasite load becomes huge. Ah, take care. This is a good question. You are wondering, once the tick is engorged and swollen and full of blood, does it stay on the animal or does it fall off? Depends on the species of tick, take care. So we get one-stage life cycle ticks, two-stage life cycle ticks, and three-stage life cycle ticks. And depending on which stage they are or what type of tick they are, will determine how they do it. If they're a one-stage uh, tick, then generally they will feed on the animal and reproduce on the animal and stay on the animal itself and engorge and then basically breed and die all on that one host. If it's a two-stage tick, sometimes it will be on the same host, but generally they drop off. They go into a molt period where they'll develop better mouth parts and another set of legs, and they will then go and drop off and find another host when they're ready to breed and reproduce and lay eggs. And if they're a three-stage life cycle tick, then generally what they do is they go on, they feed, they then fall off, molt, get more developed mouth parts, and, and, and then they go back onto a host, feed, molt, get their eighth set of legs and then well their, yes their eighth set of legs and their more developed adult mouth parts and their reproductive organs and they will then breed lay eggs and go on to another host so they have three sort of stages to their life so it just depends on the tick itself as to which one it will be and whether or not they stay or they go and it is quite a number of different ticks that we actually get out here as well LM, you're asking if ticks transfer diseases to giraffe. Um, and the thing is, yes, if they're in massive numbers. When they're in small populations like this, no, they don't. They generally, the, the giraffe's immune system is able to, to compete with it. I mean, well, basically compete and fight off any illness from them. Um, what they do get from ticks is if they are unfortunately completely covered in them then basically it causes a poisoning of the blood from all the bacteria and the ticks mouth parts and the giraffe can then become very ill and die from it but as far as tick bite fever Lyme's disease those kind of things no they don't get it like we do you know we can get a single bite and suffer from those diseases but with giraffe they need thousands and thousands and basically an oversupply of ticks to cause a infection in the blood and to make sure that well to then incapacitate this animal and kill it so it's not quite like humans, they're a lot hardier and, and their life in the wild has built up some sort of resistance to just a single tick bite. So they're able to deal with quite a bit in that regard and, and there's those ticks we were talking about. Now it sounds like there's either another giraffe or there's an elephant very close by because there was a pulling of a tree and a breaking of a branch. Now sometimes giraffe will pull at branches and there's a little crack and you sometimes hear it, but it could very well be an elephant is not far away. So I want to just go forward slightly and check if it is an Ellie while we are here and while I can hear them because it is a very dense, thick area that we're in. And maybe, just maybe, the Ellies 
are not too far away and if we don't check it out now they might disappear on us the nice thing is if it is elephants maybe they're on their way towards twin dams and we'll be able to get them drinking and hopefully Hosanna will make an appearance at the water a little bit later when it gets a bit cooler yes there is an elephant right there you see it Tenzo oh at least my ears are working today if nothing else has been working over the last two days my ears are which is fantastic news my mom will probably say that my ears don't work when I was a kid because I never used to listen but she'll be glad to know they work now it also means that I've got no excuse when she reprimands me so Lou you reckon they don't work so lucky now either Lou that's not very nice I always listen to you guys I'm a I'm the model student when it comes to being listened to to the directors and to take instruction from the directors am I not come on Lou throw me a bone here as they say <laughs> so the girls say yes they can't say no to a puppy dog's eyes and a smile well there we go we, we won Senzo well done buddy put it there there we go Senzo's my backup in this car it's a, a camp now that it was even it was uh, two boys two girls now Amanda obviously is around so then it became three girls two boys and now Senzo and I are severely outnumbered in that Ali has arrived too and she's going to be driving from Monday and it's going to be then unfortunately four girls two boys but we have reinforcements arriving soon in the form of VM the Wildebeest who's also going to be arriving on Sunday I think Sunday is it Lou yes Sunday but he'll only be out on Saturday as well I mean it's on Monday so we will have some reinforcements on the boys side of life because we can't have too many girls otherwise we're going to get overrun and we're going to be in a situation where well we know when too many girls are around they plot and scheme and they get into little groupings and then the boys are in trouble so we have to nullify that and get some reinforcements in the form of other men and well no better man's man than wildebeest vm the wildebeest to come and sort things out but it looks like quite a nice herd actually there's a few here that I can see in fact it's short trunk herd that's who exactly who it is I thought there might be a few more but short trunk is behind me I can see her to the left and then the rest of her herd slowly spread out in front and they have come from water so maybe they were the ones responsible for chasing Hosanna this afternoon because they look as though they've had some water on their ears which means that they maybe were at twin dams and might have pushed Hosanna off and into little Gary I still haven't found any tracks for him so maybe he's still around there is a school of thought that leopards are often found near to elephants and um, for some reason they like to kind of follow elephants around maybe it's the noise that they are in these areas and I had a tracker that always swore by it he, he reckoned you find elephants you find a leopard somewhere close by and strangely enough he was not that often that wrong so I wonder if maybe there isn't a leopard somewhere here uh, so Taylor McCurdy, all the way in the Maasai Mara, says I should be careful all along and not just now that there's four girls. <sighs> Don't worry, Taylor, I've always been careful. You've got to play the cards right, so you you've got to know where your bread is buttered. And so looking after the ladies and making sure that they are all happy is a good thing. Otherwise, you end up having far too many problems in life. And so better to keep all of you ladies happy and there's the saying goes what's it Senzo is a happy wife happy life is that how it is yes something like that is what all the married men tell me happy wife happy life and so you've got to <laughs> so that's apparently the rule to apply to be able to is the key to men's happiness of course you, I'll get my foot in it but you can't keep all women happy all the time so sometimes you've just got to take the hit and just say sorry and be in trouble for a while and be on the dog box and on the couch so to speak it's couch is regular for me and it happens quite often so get quite used to it after a while it's not the worst thing in the world especially when Tal taylor and ali are around then i feel like i'm in the, the the dog box more often than not the two of them gang up on me it's all very bad but it's okay i will man up and be all right and carry on <laughs> <laughs> so it's now spreading in the Maasai Mara like wildfire this conversation because now Fergus Clark who is cam up for Taylor McCurdy is also chiming in on this whole thing and he says if you like it you should put a ring on it well Fergus 
you are starting something that we, is not going to go very well and it's going to land us all in a lot of trouble so let's just leave it at that and let's not carry on any further than where we are right now although Fergus is known to be a ladies man himself he's been telling me some incredible stories of his time as he's traveled the world as a cameraman apparently the ladies love the exoticness of him filming wildlife and spectacular destinations all over the world and he loves his wine and he tends to schmooze and woos all the ladies with a bottle of wine and a little chat after a drive with some music in the background so Fergus I'm on to you I feel like you might be putting a ring on it before I do at some point soon so don't worry about me but back to wildlife and back to what we really do on the show and that's talking about wildlife of course we are wild animals ourselves at this place and our crew is full of wild characters but our elephant herd is far more important and like I said it is short trunks herd for sure now that I can see all of them and I can see short trunk behind me they're just slowly ambling around feeding and it's typical of them as we were talking about when we saw them yesterday morning is that they do spend a few days generally when they come to Juma they don't rush off out of here it's not like some of the other elephants that will come on and drink and then be gone the next day these guys tend to stick around for a few days which is always quite wonderful because we, we get to know them a lot better and they heard that we can recognize very easily and we can spend time with them and they're so relaxed and chilled that I always love being around them and they certainly are a good way to spend your afternoon it's it's very chilled and the temperature is just easing off a little bit now there's this little breeze that's blowing and it's, it feels super good to be out here at this time of the day and to be surrounded by the eddies is absolutely wonderful Now Fergus Clark has come up with a retort that I think is best left unsaid. In fact, actually, we'll leave it for him to say when we go back to Taylor. He's we, Taylor Mack, you can tell Fergus Clark from me that you can turn the camera towards him and he can answer what he's just answered and we can then see whether or not he's brave enough to say what he's just said. I, I surmise that it won't be the case, but maybe, just maybe, he'll be brave enough to say such things. <laughs> anyway, let's move on. It's interesting again that our elephants funny enough have moved into this section because this section at the moment has got a whole bunch of bush willows that are starting to flower. Now of course I say that and there's not one bush willow close enough to the camera that I can show that is flowering. There are a number that as I was driving up to the Ellie's that were flowering and so I was hoping that I would see. Actually there's one right here just on my left hand side Senzo. So this very tall one, that big one on top there, that one there is flowering. If you go up to the top of it you can see there are the bush willow flowers starting. So that little bit of rain that we had a few days ago probably triggered these bush willows to go into this flowering mode. And the ellies will be after those as well as the roots of these plants. If they see flowering plants, they often know that there's a bit of nutrition in them. And so they seem to be doing a lot of digging at the base of the bush willows and actually even pushing some of these bush willows over, not only to get to those flowers, but to get to the root structures as well. So it's amazing how their diet changes completely from the summer to the winter. In summer, it's all about grass and getting as much of the nutrients out of those grass seeds and getting the oils and all of that greatness from there. And then as we get into the winter, so they start to feed off the grass roots and a little bit of bark and, and leaves. But by the end of winter, it's mostly roots and tubers. Aunt Joe, my favorite thing about elephants without a doubt is that they are incredibly intelligent. So their intelligence is my f favorite part about them. They show a range of emotions. They are able to process a lot of different things. They can work out problems. They can find food in the harshest of climes using their intelligence by either digging or pushing over trees or whatever the case may be. Even water. We know that we get desert elephants and they're able to f survive by finding water in the, even the harshest of environments where a lot of other animals can't. So their intelligence is my favorite thing. They are incredibly interesting to watch. Their dynamics that they show within their social structure is, is very interesting as well. And that all stems from intelligence. You find more the most intelligent animals out here, for some reason, going back to our female conversation, tend to be led by females. Maybe there's something to be said for that, but tends to be our, that they are very social. They look after one another and there is this side to them that is just incredibly interesting to watch in the way that they work out and interact with their environment so their intelligence for me is the best best part about it and that is often shown to us in a lot of amazing ways Riti, um, indirectly yes I have seen elephants helping prey, uh, prey animals 
um, avoid being preyed on by carnivores, but it's an indirect um, situation. So you'll find that it's been, I've seen it with lions that were stalking buffalo and an, an elephant herd arrived at a water hole that the buffalo were coming to and they spotted the lions and chased the lions off and the buffalo were able to stampede away. So situations like that, yes. In terms of an animal that's been caught, generally no, I've never seen elephants actually chase predators off a carcass of an animal that's still alive and kicking and defending it. That I've never seen. I've only seen them chasing predators off already dead animals. But I suppose there has been incidents where, let's say, a lion has brought down some sort of animal and, and elephants arrive and the commotion to, stirs them up and they end up getting upset and chasing everybody. I suppose it does happen, but it's an indirect thing. They're not doing it to protect that individual animal that's been caught or is being preyed upon. They're doing it out of the safety of their herd and trying to protect their own babies. So, And also the commotion that has happened by having a predator around. They obviously are animals that don't like big noise and lots of commotion around them if I had to get out now and start clapping my hands and making a big noise and shouting these animals would all spread out in different directions so when there's predators hunting and there's stampeding and all of those kind of things it generally gets the ellies a bit hyped up and they'll then try and chase that predator to protect themselves so it's more an indirect situation than a direct thing where they actually are trying to protect an animal it's that they're protecting themselves and that they just don't like predators in general, especially if it's lions. If it's lions, you find that they will try and just chase them for the sake of chasing them, and often that means that they ruin lions' hunts. Now, our <laughs> now I believe Chirpy McCurdy has not stopped and is still going, as well as her ladies' man in the back. I wonder if he's schmoozing Taylor with a bottle of wine and some cheese in the Maasai Mara this afternoon. Right, apparently what well I'm Chirpy McCurdy, that sounds about right. I'll sass you back, Tristan. You watch yourself. <laughs> and, oh, at least you got nice compliments from the other side there. Hey Ferg, ladies man, it's not bad. <laughs> right, so we've moved actually moved completely out of the area now from where we had the sausage tree pride. I'm not sure where they are, but it's been exceptionally hot out here today and we saw this morning that there wasn't really much shade around barring a couple of trees casting a few shadows here and there. I suspect they either moved into the river line where it would have been nice and cool but it's quite difficult to see what's going on down there on account of all the trees uh, or they've gone up towards their favorite uh, hill. I checked Lion Island there was nothing on Lion Island but there's those nice rocks there's lots of shade so they could just be that side. So I thought what we'd do is we head down towards the Mara River and have a look around there, see if we can find anything. Maybe we get lucky, maybe we get to see bat and foxes again like we had yesterday. It's, I don't think it's a coincidence that we've seen uh, them there. I reckon if we look hard enough, we might be able to get them again. And I think it would be quite nice to try and see them as often as we can. And who knows, maybe we can eventually habituate them and they'll get used to us. Um, not necessarily like lions and leopards, but just long enough that they don't mind the vehicles and they'll carry on. Because I would really like to get to know the bat foxes a little bit better and watch some of their behavior. Because as we know, there is only so much you can learn from books and you can read the rest of it. You actually have to sit and experience uh, for yourself. Uh, but it's hard to spend time with things like bat foxes, with aardvils, with porcupine, aardvark. You know, the shy critters that don't really like to hang around. So, so that, that's going to be the plan, I think. And who knows? I think it's always a good area to check towards Serena. Um, just because we know that Scar likes that area. The Musketeers like it around there. So hopefully we can get a glimpse of them. I'd like to see all of them. It would be really fantastic. But we can't be greedy, aren't you? We can only take what nature hands us. And sometimes, you know, you get lucky packets, a variety of different things. And sometimes, you know, you just get a little lollipop every now and then. Well, that's okay. Well, sometimes you get nothing. You just get the empty wrapper. You lick the inside out if you like. But <laughs> and um, I'm surprised that we're actually not seeing more things because there's not much wind out today. What have you seen, Ferg? Like the vultures. No problem. Ferg has requested a shot, so Ferg, get, la ladies' man, gets what he wants. But I'm going to go off-road a bit here for you. Is, is that fine? There we go. So I will show you now. Ferg will show you exactly what he's talking about. 
Um, it's it's actually exceptionally pretty. We have got two vultures sitting in a tree. K I S S I N G. No, that's not what they're doing. They are probably getting ready to roost for the evening. And <laughs> now Ferg is now. I've got. It's like, what's going on? Ferg was going R O O S T I N G. Doesn't quite go with the song, but we can make it work. That's actually magical. Look at the clouds, the formation of the clouds, all starting to climb vertically. So those are developing cumulonimbus clouds. So those are big rain clouds. There are plenty of them. And uh, just from looking at the silhouette of these vultures, you can see they've got quite a robust head. The feathers look fairly dark, but it's difficult because they are silhouetted. So I'm going to go and say that it's a pair of lappet-faced vultures sitting up there. I actually saw a lappet-faced vulture nest the other day. It wasn't on the side, though. It was in the Masai Mara National Park. So next time I go that way, I'm going to try and find it again. It was also near a hyena den. So that's quite nice. So obviously those birds have done for the day. They've decided that it's going to make a good enough perch where they will rest until tomorrow morning. Unless somebody comes and startles them, then they'll have to move perches. But for now, that seems to be great. Look how breathtaking this view is. Look at that. I mean, that is just unbelievable. Where do you get views like this other than in the Mara? Now, Peyton, you said it's amazing how the storms just pop up out of nowhere. I was commenting on the weather today. Jamie and I were actually discussing it. I said, I've never seen such sort of dramatic weather. And and I'm still amazed how you can drive around the rain. And I, I keep saying this. I laughed when Steph and Jamie and Brent and James and everyone would tell me uh, you can drive around the rain. Or I hear it as an update. You know, we can't go to James. James is just quickly, you know, zipping around a cloud and I think what on earth are these people talking about you know what are they eating out here <laughs> it's literally exactly that it's really spectacular and the wind is picking up now too there's a bit of a chill I, I don't see any clouds coming from the east so I think we could be safe for now however this evening could be a completely different story and we're like we were just discussing you know in an hour's time we could be um, soaking wet but for now, the rain is just going along sort of south of us. I wonder if Jamie's not getting wet because that's the areas that she's heading into and it just keeps coming and coming. So it'll be interesting to find out if she's started putting on her rain covers yet or if she's made it safely to the other side of the rain. It's not very, uh, it sort of stretches quite wide, but uh, it doesn't seem to extend too far south. Just a little band of rain clouds. That is lovely. That's another opportunity for a wallpaper, don't you think? Remember to hashtag Safari Live. <laughs> Woo! He writes a special request from Angela. Mm -mm -mm. Everyone wants to know, Ferg, why are you called the ladies' man? He's now fixing his eyebrows as we speak. Stop pretending like you're not going to show yourself on camera. Come on. I'm yeah. a man of mystery, Angela. <laughs> Are you not going to show yourself? No, that is love a bit of mystery. I'll do an Insta story and <laughs> and then I'll just shove the camera in his face. No. Put my Zorro mask back on. It's, it's... <laughs> You're so ridiculous. Oh no. Right, so Ferg is shy. Um, I'm not going to spill Ferg's secrets, unfortunately, Angela. You're just going to have to ask him yourself one day if you have the pleasure of meeting him. Right, off to the river we go. Hopefully we'll have crocodiles and hippos and lions and wildebeests and batian foxes and all these wonderful things. However, the race is now on between Rockstar Tristan, the leopard finder, and I as to who is going to find the cats first. Ooh, Taylor, this is going to be an interesting one as to who's going to find a cat first, but we shall definitely try to see if we can find one before you. Should be an interesting challenge this because there's a promise of a cat in Hosanna somewhere around this area and we've just got to try and find him before they find something in the Mara. Interesting. Now in terms of Fergus, I'm very surprised at Fergus. Fergus is a ladies man and he does like normally to show himself off so I'm surprised that he hasn't taken up the challenge but I'm going to try and find my fo a photo of any picture that I've got maybe of Fergus or I'll try and scan around to see I did remember taking one with him once before when we were on drive and there was a photo 
of us and even with Byron as well. So I'm going to try and find Ferg and see if there isn't a picture somewhere that we can show all of you ladies because everybody wants to know whether you're a ladies man, Ferg. Maybe we can help you out along the way since you're so desperate to put a ring on it. Maybe we can find somebody that can oblige and help you out with that process. But that is our littlest member of the short trunk herd who's flapping it its ears away and it's a little boy that one so and the reason we know it's a little male <coughs> is only just because I've seen it so often that we know that often his genitals sometimes hang out and he doesn't seem to care and so that's how we know at that age it is quite tough to sex elephants their foreheads haven't developed properly yet and um, that's normally how you would sex them the easiest ways <coughs> the bulls have a rounded forehead and the females a very angular squared off forehead in young ones you'll find that the head is pretty similar because they haven't grown and they haven't developed and, and obviously the bones are still going into the right places and settling in the right ways and so that's why you get a situation where the head is slightly rounded even in females at that age. Toy time I think it is. You want to know what nutrients are best for elephants or most sought after for elephants. Um, Difficult to say. I'm not 100% sure. I think they, they pretty much want everything. If you look at an elephant's diet, they will feed off pretty much everything, obviously bar protein that is meat, but they will go after roots, tubers, leaves, grasses, seeds, fruits. So they pretty much cover most nutrient values. They also, sometimes you'll find them even crunching down in a bit of soil. I have seen them doing it once or twice before. So that's geophagia, which they maybe, if there's nutrients that they're lacking, they're able to get it from the soil, something like a sodic soil, which is high in sodium content. Um, so I don't know if there's one specific nutrient that they need above all others, but they certainly do eat a variety of food sources. They're not just one sort of food source animal. They will make sure that they, even in a day-to-day -day basis, are feeding off a multiple different plants so they're going to feed off like I say roots tubers bark leaves fruits seeds anything they can really get their hands on that's vegetation based they will trunks on should I say um, they will go after it so they require a lot of different nutrients to power such a large body and so they're not very sort of specific on a nutrient that they want the most and also, of course, is is dependent on soil types as to what these nutrients are available in specific areas. Eduardo, they are flapping their ears to cool themselves down. Now, if you look at this individual that's walking past us, you'll note that there's these kind of stains on the side of the body. So there's this dark patch just on the shoulder area, and then it's lighter. And the reason why that is darker is because they have been spraying water onto their ears to cool them down. But when they flap like this, there is a rich network of veins on the back side of the ears covered by a very thin layer of skin and as they flap they're pulling air over those rich network of veins and that's cooling the blood down by as much as two to three degrees centigrade in a series of three to four flaps which is really not very much at all and so that blood is cooled quite fast when they spray water and flap it then just aids that cooling even further and helps to keep this animal very comfortable in these hot warm climes that Africa has so that is why they are flapping the ears it's all just to try and control the body it's basically like a radiator of a car and that's why they do it so they constantly at work keeping themselves regulated and their body temperature regulated so as that they can stay cool out here very clever system actually and now when you see it flap forward you might be able to see the veins it's quite difficult since if you maybe can go a little closer in for me and there you go you can see the veins as it goes forward you'll see big thick rigid veins of course now it's not going to do it there we go there I don't know if you can see them very nicely but they are there every now and then when the ear flaps forward and so like I say that pulls the wind you'll also notice how the ear on the back side flaps over so it almost provides its own shade even when it flaps forward like that that ear falls back into the body to try and create a little bit of shade over those veins and just to keep that body as cool as possible. It's a very cool system to have and, and it's why their ears are so big as well. You can also see that the, the ear is in front of that big flap and so what happens with them is when they have these big ears and they're flapping forward and they hold it forward that's not to try and cool down. When they push the ear forward and hold it there that is to listen better so they're creating almost like a satellite dish to catch sound but what you're seeing now is most certainly to cool themselves down. It is a hot day today so they will be trying to get their temperature and their core body temperature down as much as possible.
an EV brat. An elephant has charged me. A couple times I've been charged by elephants. It's not the most pleasant experience. Luckily, every single time has been more a warning charge than anything else. It's been to tell me I'm a bit close and I must back off. I've had only one bull ever charge me properly and it was lucky that I saw him from quite a way away and he was already grumpy and I knew about him from the fact that he had been chased by other um, well, he chased other cars, should I say, and he had caused a bit of an issue. So I knew about a certain individual, and he was very easy to tell. He only had one tusk, and he was seriously grumpy. He was in must, which is a heightened level of testosterone. And we saw him way in the distance on this very thick road. So I was super glad that I saw him far, because if I had come around a corner and he had been right there, I think I would have been in a lot of trouble. But we basically went down this road along the Sabi River, thick vegetation on both sides, elephant that saw us from far and just started running. And luckily, I was able to reverse, and there was a little gap, and turn and swing and by the time I turned he was probably about 15 meters behind us still ears going crazy dust everywhere and him trumpeting as he was barreling down towards us luckily then once you turned around and you're in first gear you're out of there before he can even get anywhere near you and the reason why I drove away from him and, and why sometimes we won't drive away from charging elephants is because he was a big big bull and the previous times he had charged vehicles he had really come very close and I, there was only a matter of time until somebody challenged him enough to actually push him over the edge and for him to hit us if it was a young bull that was still around sort of 20 years old I would have most certainly just stood my ground and basically taught him it's not good to change taste cars but that individual was already a much older bull he was around 40 50 years old and he's not going to tolerate nonsense if he decides to get angry so better just to leave him alone drive away let him calm down and let him just carry on with his day and leave him be so I have had that incident on foot I've had one elephant charge me and luckily I was on a big termite mound and so by the time he kind of charged towards the termite mound he realized well I'm not going to be able to get up this mound and not actually get to these guys and so he just stopped at the bottom of the mound trumpeted at us and when I say the bottom of the mound I mean he was probably about maybe four meters from us at the bottom and he was basically eye level with us but he was just trumpeting and very upset you could see there was a number of hitting of trees and all kinds of other things but because we were on the mound and we were slightly higher than him he was a little bit more kind of nervous to carry on and the mound was very steep and for him to have come up would have been quite tough but that certainly took a bit of breathing afterwards to calm back down I want to just try and get into a better place where we can view these ellies slightly better than what we have got now um, it's not great, but from here maybe. So Cape Turtle Dove, you are saying we see um, short trunks heard regularly and we see them quite often, but fangs heard we haven't seen return for quite some time. And do elephants have regular areas that they move around in, or are they territorial, or what's the, what's the deal, and why do we see one and not the other? Well, the, the reason for it is, oh, specific routes that they take. Well, it's quite a complicated question, but they, I'll, I'll basically, it's quite an interesting answer, is that in the case of short trunks herd, the reason we probably see her more than what we're seeing fangs herd at the moment is to do with the fact that it's a small herd versus a very large herd. Fangs herd is very big and the way that they will utilize resources is much more than what you would see with short trunks herd. So they're going to use water and food a lot more than what short trunk would and maybe this area just does not have enough in the, in the way of water to sustain fangs herd for long periods of time. Hence they've moved into other areas like the river systems of the Sabi or the Sand River where they're spending all their time feeding and drinking and, and utilizing those areas. In terms of home ranges, yes elephants have home ranges. It will vary depending on the size of the herd. Again from a nutrient perspective they need to be able to feed the herd, provide water for the herd and so that means that they will then expand accordingly. If the herd grows much larger, you tend to find that the home range tends to get bigger. Um, there are regular routes that they will also walk, so they know exactly where water points are, they know where riverbeds are, drainage systems are, and where their favorite food items are. And so they will utilize that and walk in specific routes to get there. We find that they often are up and down the Mulawati. You can find elephant herds and specific ones that will go to certain places within the reserve and drink off them. This particular herd, very seldom do we see it on the western side towards Treehouse Dam. We do see them there from time to time, but she favors twin dams and then straight up to Gauri Dam and then into Buffalo's Hook and then back along the same route again. Fangs herd seem to go from 
twin dams, Gauri Dam, and then westwards and northwards a little bit to, to Biffleshook and then westwards into Arethusa and south then from there into Londo. So it's different routes because of the sizes of the herds more than anything else, but there will be very specific ways that they will get to certain places. They will follow routes that they know and that they've used before to get into those areas. It's, they're intelligent animals and it's the same as us like taking a road to get home. We might take a different road if there's traffic or there's some sort of reason, but otherwise we typically use the same road home and it's the same thing with these guys. They know where they want to go, they know where the water is, they know where food is and they will utilize those areas, but they do have home ranges and environmental conditions will impact whether they utilize that home range in the core of it or they expand it or whatever the case may be. Last year's drought I think has changed a lot of the home ranges that we're used to and you might find that the herds that we see a lot in the summer months because of last year's heavy drought and the lack of food available here at the moment they might have pushed somewhere else and the smaller herds are still then able to survive in these places because they're so small and they're not utilizing nearly as much vegetation and water as what those bigger herds would utilize. Hopefully though Fang's herd does come back. I'm sure when we get some rains we are going to find them. Um, Fang's herd is an interesting one because I've I want to go back and replay a lot of the footage and just try and find other individuals within the grouping that I can try and recognize so that if hypothetically they do arrive here again and we know it's that particular grouping, if Fang isn't there then we know that maybe something has happened to her or hasn't happened to her or whatever the case may be but it would be good just to recognize some of the other individuals just in case something has gone awry and she's no longer with them that we do recognize those individuals and know for sure that that herd has come back towards this area. So of course we, we take little notice of the other females in Fang's herd not from a point of view that we don't watch them, but we just don't recognize them as easily because she's so iconic and so distinctive. It's always quick and easy just to recognize her. And same as the short trunk herd. If you had to see these other three individuals away from short trunk, we would probably really battle to ID them. But with her being here, we then immediately can tell, given the sizes, that we know that this is her herd immediately. So it's just interesting how one individual with a certain characteristic can be the sort of go-to identifying feature and outside of that it becomes a lot harder to actually work out who they are. Remember also that we see a lot of different elephants. In the summer months we can sometimes see over two, three hundred elephants here in an afternoon um, if if things go right and so it's it's pretty crazy how many elephants can go through and to recognize every single one of those especially because some of them are so transient and move around in here for a day and then are gone for a month it is very difficult to know exactly which elephants we're dealing with from time to time so ones that have got markings like fang or short trunk really do help us with being able to see who is who beautiful nonetheless though to spend time with them they are so so cool these this herd they're very chilled and i was hoping they were going to be slowly making their way to the Malawa, to the twin dams for a drink but i think they've already come from there given there is these moisture stains on their bodies i think they've already had a drink and i wouldn't be surprised by tomorrow morning we find them somewhere in the mulawati heading up towards gari dam for a drink around the nest cam and also just to go and mud wallow if it's a hot day because they will be just like any other elephant herd that they'll enjoy a good mud wallow but watch her now she's busy kicking soil away so she's digging up roots and that little baby is sitting right there and is going to be learning very carefully how to do this so even though it's probably not strong enough to dig very well just yet it's watching mom it's getting the technique it's seeing how that she uses her feet and that little baby is going to be gleaning knowledge just from standing by sides her mom and just slowly feeding off some grasses and trees she's going to be learning exactly how to get food in these tough winter months when there's not much available so it's really interesting to watch and you can see look there she goes again so it's almost like she's showing the little one where to go you see that she's using her foot right where the little one's got its trunk that's exactly where she's dug she then moved back and is almost as if to say come you feed off this learn what this is you're going to need to eat it later in life and they are incredibly caring mothers and they will do these kind of things they will teach their young ones they will basically move things around for the young ones to learn and you can see she's actually shifting this bush willow to expose those roots i was talking about it earlier that they will go after the roots and she's doing that now so she's pushing the bush willow in a way that she's going to be able to expose the roots better and there's the little one coming in to feed now and go and get to where she's just exposed so very very cool to see a little lesson on feeding behavior now i'm not sure if i heard this right because it sounds 
completely false or fabricated, but apparently Taylor has a, a spoon of a Goliath with a yellow bill. So who knows what that's all about, but I'm sure it'll be entertaining nonetheless. It normally is with Taylor Mac and Fergus Clark on camera. <laughs> and um, it's not the correct term, but it just it sort of reminds me of this. Like there's a crack of some sort and all this water gathers here and it is perfect for birding as well as the hyenas like to lay in it. And we have a yellow-billed stork here, which is beautiful. I wish we could get a break in the clouds now and get some lovely golden light on it. That would be really nice. And it's quite interesting, the the stork out of the three different bird species we've got here. So uh, you can't really, oh, there comes a the spoonbill again. So we've also got an African spoonbill and we have a goliath heron, which we'll show you is in the far corner. And it's just amazing the different types of fishing techniques that these birds will use. Obviously, it doesn't look like the Goliath heron, the largest heron in the world, is uh, doing much at the moment, except just walking through the water. Uh, and maybe it's going to find a tree to roost on. It is getting a little bit dark now. So they've obviously got a very sharp spear-like beak, which they will try and stab through a fish, as you would if you were spear fishing. That's what they will try and do. They'll plunge their long necks into the water and sometimes stick their whole heads under the water too and catch frogs and catch fish, uh, anything, maybe even a small terrapin it would probably take, uh, quite a little one. I mean, they're, they're massive birds. And then you've got the others, well, for instance, the African, oh, okay, we can go to the storky, the yellow-billed stork, who stands with its beak gape and does different types of techniques there. It's going to the grassy spots and using its feet and moving around and stirring the water up to try and chase out some of those smaller invertebrates and fish. Sammy Jane, you said that you love watching these birds fish. It is amazing. I could sit here the entire day. And and that's an amazing technique. And then when we first saw the stork, we saw it doing something completely different. It just had its mouth open, its mouth, its beak agape, and waiting to snap a fish. Wait, this, <laughs> that's like me when I go to the beach and something touches my foot in the water. I leap, but I leap much further out of the water, um, I, unfortunately. So something must have tickled its foot, maybe a little terrapin uh, moving across or a fish. And then, of course, look at that, the spoonbill stealing the show there. So the spoonbill also fish likes to fish. A lot of people get confused and think that they're filter feeders, but they're not. So also opening its beak and is trying to flush out by moving its bill from side to side, trying to snap up any little critters. And I really hope if we sit here for long enough, we will be successful and we'll be able to see something like this. But they're beautiful birds. It's... um. Something that we we don't get to sit and watch very often, and I love my birding. I really do. I find it absolutely fascinating. Oh, it, hang on. Did the stork get something? Looked like it won't. No. Unlucky. Hmm. Maybe a little a little insect of sort. Maybe a tiny little fish that the spoonbill got. Come on, one of you catch something for us. I feel like we've invested so much time now. Look how they're coming right to the edge. And they've settled down with us which was quite nice. They're a bit nervous and they moved away when we first arrived here. And, and normally that happens with birds and well, sometimes with the animals too, is that they'll move away from you. But if you just sit quietly and you sit in the same spot, they'll relax and they'll come back to you. So this is, again, quite interesting. They, you know, it looks like they're not really working together, but they're moving in the same direction. So if one of them, you know, chases a fish out or a frog out, the other one's got a chance of catching it if it misses. Now, Riti, wondering if there's this particular type of fish that they feed on, or if it's just any fish. It's it's just anything. Uh, I'm sure there's tilapia of sorts in here. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't even be able to tell you which type of tilapia. I have yet to see any fish. Um, there's definitely some catfish uh, swimming around in here, and maybe some smaller little species as well. Uh, I'm not actually familiar with the the types of fish that are around here. I'll have to get a book. And, and have a little look. I'm sure there'll be uh, lots of smaller species of fish too. Maybe, some, no, I don't think you get sickles up here. Maybe in the lakes and things, but not maybe not on the river. But there they go, off they go again. An odd couple. <laughs> look at that. I just love the way that they just change up, and particularly the stork, the way that it just, you know, changes its feeding techniques. And quite regularly, because now since we've been sitting here, it's, I think it's done it about three times where it's either just walked uh, with its beak open, hoping to, you know, snap something 
right in between its beak and or then it uses its foot when it gets to those grassy bits and that's where the fish will also go because remember on a hot day there's not much shade around but those bits of grass will most certainly cast a shadow and that's sometimes what the herons like to do um, you know with a black heron for example that folds its wings into an umbrella and hides it he hides its head it'll do that out in the open and the fish are attracted to that and it will come through and sit right underneath it where it is in striking range. So the fishing techniques of birds is absolutely incredible to sit and see them. All we need now is a kingfisher sitting on the edge of the bank ready to spear its sharp beak into the water. Oh, Tina, you've said that the spoonbill is number 30 on your Mara list. Congratulations. Actually, I need to add a few more birds to my list too. Shall I do that while I'm here? While you watch the birds, let me find it. I have to find a pen though. Where is my pen? And the page. Ooh, hello. There's another stalk. What's going on over here? Look at the beautiful colours of the plumage of this one. Now, they're both the same species. Why is one bigger than the other? Is one a juvenile or one a male or one a female? Let me get my phone out. I want to have a quick look and see who is larger. That's quite interesting. Not so, no, no. Oh, these apps, they all just open at the same time. Isn't that ridiculous? Kestrel Fox, you're wondering if you get the black hair in here. I have yet to see it. Um, I don't think so. I don't think it occurs here. They were in Zambia, if I'm not mistaken. I think I remember seeing black heron. Yes, I did see black herons on the Zimbizi River and the tributaries. Um, but I have not seen them here. But I haven't really had a chance to do much birding at all. What am I looking for? Stalk. Right, see, I get so distracted, I can't concentrate on my original plan. Let's go. Yellow-billed stalk. Let's see who is larger. Um, must be a juvenile. I'm just thinking because the size difference is quite big. So maybe this one is just a youngster and hasn't quite grown into itself just yet. But there's a but I'm not going crazy. Can you see a pink tinge? You can, eh? Hey? Hmm, okay, and a few of you have also noticed that, so that's quite interesting. Typically you start to see that with um flamingos when they are eating um, shellfish it normally enhances that pink color. I've forgotten what the chemical is called now for the life of me. I apologize. I have not spoken about flamingos and their coloration for a very, very long time because uh, I have yet to see a flamingo in the Sabi sand, although I have heard of some stories, and Brent was telling stories about them being at Singita or Londolozi at one point. Um, but, but yes, I wonder if it's just not, it's di diet related perhaps. Again, I've, this first time I've actually seen it on a yellow billed stalk. But interesting, but much larger than the other. You can see it when it again came crash landing in. And look at this one. Look at the different technique now, completely submerging its bill and moving it from side to side and just standing stationary. So isn't this isn't this fantastic how we're sitting here and observing the various fishing techniques? Oh fantastic. So Tristan's going to go on and on and on about when you go back to him about the uh, animals and their pinkish tinge. I've completely forgotten what all the special words are and all that. So we'll, we'll go to him. And but it's got it's diet related. And I know that in zoos and bird sanctuaries and stuff like that, what they often do is they're quite sneaky because that's not what really the um, flamingos are feeding. They're normally fed a type of you know food, and they'll put food coloring in the water to to enhance their colors, which I think is a bit of a cheat. <laughs> But there we go. So that seems to be the stock standard thing. As soon as you find grassy patches, you stick your feet in there. And you give it a bit of a wriggle and hope that something comes out. Doesn't seem to be um, too much life in this water, though, because I haven't seen them catch anything yet. Look at that. That's a beautiful shot. They're not really the most attractive-looking birds now, are they? Especially when you look at them that close. But how's that beak? That's amazing. I wouldn't like to be pecked by, and maybe a spoonbill would be okay, I can't imagine that would be too sore, but I would not like to be pecked by a heron, by that goliath heron or this yellow-billed stork. Come on, that would be perfect if you could catch something. Oh, very cool. This is so interesting. 
Wonderful. So it seems as though Jamie is up and running. Hopefully she has reached her destination and it sounds like she's got something stunning to show you. We do. We have something utterly gorgeous to show you. It's not an animal. It is a view. And I think it's one of the most spectacular views I've seen in the Mara so far. There's just something about the way that the light is hitting the rain over Tanzania and then shining across the plains. It really is breathtaking. That's spectacular. Zebra, rain, looking across the vast open spaces. Very, very pretty. Now that we've shown you a very, very pretty view, I'll have to tell you something that broke my heart. A moment ago, Craig and I were sitting with a female leopard and her cub. Unfortunately, right down in a very deep lugger, very deep drainage system, and no matter what we did, we just couldn't find the signal to show it to you. I think it's the same female you've seen with Brent and with Taylor. Really pretty girl. I didn't want to leave, but we had to. We just couldn't find signal. It's one of those things. The highs and lows of the terrain it's just not possible for us to be able to show you everything in certain areas. So what we've done is we've, moving on, we've come to find the cheetah that Brent saw in this area as well. Mm. She's here somewhere. I'm going to search thoroughly. And if we don't manage with her, we'll go and find some lions. Let's go back all the way across to South Africa, equally beautiful, and enjoy some scenes with Tristan. Well, beautiful is a good way to describe it, Jamie. This is our bachelor Fergus Clark cam operator out of South Africa. He likes long walks on the beach and play the guitar for ladies under starry nights for those that deserve it. He's also a connoisseur of wine, cheeses and various other food items. He likes, like I say, long strolls on the beach and travel. He's also been a cameraman for a number of years, seen some amazing things and has been all over the world. He's also dabbled in a bit of music as well. So an eligible bachelor for sure. Now ladies, you'll have to tell us if he's worth putting a ring on it or not. <laughs> There is Fergus Clark, the cameraman. He's probably going to punch me for that. But anyway, he's in the Maasai Mara, so there's not much he can do about it from there until such time as he gets back here. Lou, you'll have to, I think you're going to have to fight off many others in order to get towards Ferg. <laughs> anyway, back to more serious stuff. Now, interestingly enough, I heard about Taylor's bird with the, the pinkish pigments on the back. It is... Uh, Basically diet related in the yellow billed storks. It does happen quite regularly with them. They do get a pink coloration quite often It's called erythrism. It's basically a coloration of red pigments that forms in the in the feathers You do see it sometimes in some birds where it's they born with it It's a congenital um, defect that they have and they basically have an over supply of red, pig, red pigments And they then get that kind of reddish tone, but with them It's a diet related thing and the way it comes from is it actually comes from freshwater to mussels. So when they feed or freshwater mussels, they get this um, red and pink pigment that develops on their feathers and they become very deep in that color. In and the reason why I know this is because we used to see yellow billed storks at La Bomba and Brent, who's not out this afternoon, would be able to attest to that and would be able to explain it also because, well, Brent used to spend time at La Bomba too and the yellow billed storks there display it quite commonly. So. It is a common process with them and they do often show that reddish pink pigments a lot of the time. So I just want to get down this hill quickly and then need to rescue my water bottle that has fallen between my feet because, well, I don't want to end up in a situation where I can't drive because a water bottle gets stuck on the accelerator or something like that. Come on. Now I'm back in the Mulawati, back towards Twin Dams, just to check around if Osana hasn't come back to the water now that it's getting 
that time of the day it's getting cooler now the sun is starting to set it's perfect time for a leopard to be moving around so I want to just slowly meander my way around this area and just check I'll check the fire break I'm gonna check Gary Main and just do a real thorough scan of what's going on now the last tracks that I think are his it's obviously difficult because he's been here so much and we know Tumbo was here yesterday afternoon and they've walked around here all the time and there's tracks for these two everywhere in this general vicinity but the last track that I can see that looks like from him is actually just in front on my left hand side here so it comes off that bank and down so that's where I think he's come from and he's then crossed onto this bank now it could be from last night and it could be tracks that are not worth following but they also could be fresh tracks and worth having a look around at so just slowly meandering in this section I know both of them I've seen them both spending a lot of time just on the top side of this bank under a tall tree that's just on my right hand side here so I might just do a little quick loop around hopefully we won't have a repeat occurrence of what happened yesterday because that's exactly where Rusty broke his steering arm so let's not have that again but we will just go and have a little check there's some eroded gullies there a little bit of shade not a bad place for a leopard to lie so would be worth having a little look around and somewhere here that his tracks came down it was on that wall somewhere so general vicinity is right and Hopefully we will find him somewhere in this typical section. Senzo's on the lookout. He's scouting, checking, trying to use those eagle eyes of his to find us a cat because we don't want to break our streak. But I feel like it might happen today. It might be the day that we break it. I hope not, but let's see. It doesn't look very positive at this, uh, at this stage. And there's a kingfisher. <laughs> so, <laughs> Kaiji, you say there's no cure for khaki fever, and Kate, you say, wow, wow, just wow, Ferg is very handsome. Ferg, you've got some admirers, Lou, you've got some competition, this is all going to get very interesting. And I think Ferg is about to get a lot of mail on his Twitter and Instagram accounts, I feel like... He may not be very happy with me, but oh well. He started it, he, he got involved in the banter, and well, if you're gonna dish it out, you're going to have to take it too. Is that not right, Senzo? Yeah. Yeah, Senzo says yes, exactly. Right, now up we go. Hopefully Rusty's going to survive this bout. We've been very tentative with Rusty today. We haven't taken him over too much. We've been protecting him, but it's now time for him to do a bit of work and for us to find a leopard. It's that time of the day I need a leopard fix in my life so let's see if we can find little Hosanna somewhere up on this bank I have a funny feeling that if he is up here I would be very surprised I have a funny feeling he is south in Little Gari nobody can give me an update though everyone says that they are down with shadow on Hoffman so that's actually a good update to be giving all of you because I know a lot of you worry about shadow and what's been happening with her but apparently she's there on Little Gauri and is just taking it easy apparently she's fine she's still got a bit of a limp but not too bad at this stage so that's really good news and I'm glad to hear that shadow is somewhat okay I'm not sure if her cub is there it was really bad quality audio I couldn't hear very well couldn't make out a lot of what they were saying but I just got shadow Hoffman's and that was kind of where it ended so I'm not sure if the cub is there I did ask I did say is the cub there but all I got back was and that's unfortunately I don't speak and so I wasn't able to understand but I will try and speak to the guys after drive just send a message to them and find out what's happening with that cub and if it's been seen because we haven't seen it this side for quite some time and let's try and avoid some of these fallen over stumps Jared's buddy you are asking me about the female track that I've spoke about yesterday morning up near Buffelsuk boundary and whether or not I think it could be for Shongile tough to say uh, it might be it also might be for Tandi we know Tandi is moving around a lot these days and it could very well be for her so I'm not hundred percent sure to be honest I, I really am not sure um, it would be a big call to make I, I didn't look at the tracks for very long because of our lack of signal I was trying to get out of that area and trying to get somewhere to help Brent a little bit and so I didn't um, look very hard at those tracks uh, they were heading also anyway into Buffalo's Hook so there's not really much I could do with them so um, I think in all likelihood it's probably Tandi it could it could be Shongile it, it really could given where it was but I think in all likelihood 
in my mind, I don't know, Tandy just seems to come to mind for it. I could be wrong, like I say, it's, it's one of those things where you might be wrong, you might be right. You just try and kind of think about it and see. Now I need to stop for two seconds and not because Rusty is broken but because the little thing that goes over our steering wheel, our little rubber kind of attachment that goes over all the gaffer tape that we have on Rusty's steering wheel because Rusty's steering wheel was wearing down, slipped off and if it slips off it gets stuck in the steering wheel and then you can't turn and you fight and then the brakes and then I'm going to be in trouble and I think I've done enough damage to the cars over the last 24 hours that I will try and avoid doing any more for the next little bit at the end of the day we don't want <laughs> these cars damaged any further than what they are already by me and it's taken its toll following leopards around the last two weeks oh well it's what Land Rovers are built for they meant to be they meant to break down and come back up again that's how we do it they are a car that is suited for this kind of work because they small and light and they are excellent at getting into these small places but there is often sometimes a little bit of damage that gets done but the nice thing about that is as we proved yesterday is that they can be fixed with just a spanner and a wheel spanner which is really kind of very few cars that can actually have that situation so nice to have them and nice that we can fix them when we need to should there be any issues right now no sign of Hassan I thought he might be up on this bank lying in these little Tamburti thickets that we have on my right hand side it's just on the edge it's shady it's a perfect place for a leopard just to hide out particularly if things like baboons were around so that's why I wanted to just check here and make double sure that he wasn't in this section so it seems as though he's not here and that means that well I think I'm going to do Gauri Main maybe check Treehouse Dam we know that he does go to Treehouse Dam check that general vicinity if there's nothing there then we'll come with a spotlight make double sure there's nothing at the dam and if there's really nothing after that then we're gonna head off to where we had those male leopard tracks on Zoe's which I'm sure is Tingana's but I think in all likelihood Tingana must be inside Arethusa. I didn't get an update I did ask but I couldn't hear what was going on from the Arethusa side of the world right now we are going to have a sunset in just a little bit not quite just yet it's still got a little bit of a way to go but i believe taylor mccurdy does have a sunset so let's jump across to her and see her beautiful orange globe going down very very quickly i'm sorry but look how stunning this is it is so dramatic and it's almost as though the Olololo escarpment has taken on the color of the Drakensberg Mountains, which are also known as the Blue Mountains. But I suppose that's very typical for any mountain range at this time of the day. But uh, with the dark clouds above it and those highlights of orange, it really is spectacular. You know, I used to think that we'd get the most amazing sunsets and sunrises at Juma, but there's some serious stiff competition. And I now understand why Brent won. One day, it was myself, Tristan and Brent, where we had competitions trying to get the best sunset shot. Or maybe it was with Byron, and then Brent had won. And I can clearly see why. We really cannot compare the scenery to Juma, um, well, sorry, from Mara to Juma. Uh, I suppose they're very different in, in, their own, in their own ways. I mean, those Marula trees make for the most unbelievable silhouettes. Yes, we've got a couple of trees that have got nice flat tops which are quite pretty and the Olololo escarpment and of course the rain that we can see in the difference and the difference in the distance but um it is absolutely absolutely stunning Ooh! so apparently we're going to start another competition so that's all rain down there that's why you can't see anything anymore that's just uh, the water falling from the sky tristan has said that uh, he thinks the sunset at juma might give us a run for our money so i'm very excited for this so we'll have a sunset off then uh, you can hashtag safari live uh, with the screenshots that you would have taken from my sunset and the sun should be setting soon at juma it's a little bit early is it yeah Maybe in the next 10 minutes or so, it'd be really good. There are the clouds, the low-lying clouds that are bringing a lot of the rain. Uh, they remind me of spaceships, though, those, <laughs> those big flat white clouds. Uh, it's very, this is a real ominous sky. I mean, that's one of the, I think it's actually a standard. When you apply for a job at uh, Wild Earth, especially to be a presenter, they ask you, this is one of the things that they said, they say, use the word ominous in a sentence. <laughs> I feel like that's a word that we definitely say way too often, although I haven't heard anybody using it for quite some time. 
uh, it's every now and then we give it a break and then we bring it back again um, but that's always funny to do and uh, I used to do it to my teachers because I was very naughty at school but they loved me but I was naughty um, I never got expelled or suspended or anything like that but detention I went to often oh okay apparently we want to have one more look at the sunset so basically what i would do is certain teachers would say certain words quite frequently and i'd sit when i was not paying attention in class which was most days and i would do a tally of how many times they said a particular word i think that could be a fun challenge to do at some point on some of those quieter drives is figure out you guys know what our catch phrases are or the words that we like to use often you know more than what we do we don't realize that we're saying them so maybe the next couple of days we can start doing tallies if you find yourself bored and wanting to be entertained but that's lovely right so here's our beautiful view once again the light is starting to fade but i think it's about time we go across to tristan and see if his sunset is as good as what he said well our sunset might not be about big open fields and grasses and well beautiful views of the landscape but we do get the most incredible bright orange sun that disappears between the leadwood branches that are on the banks of the Mulawati and it is still a wonderful thing to see as it goes through those branches and, and just kind of slowly disappears over the horizon so we get these beautiful colors that start to kind of appear in the bush and it is a, a fantastic place to see them I always love watching the sunsets in the Sabi sands just because of the trees that we've got and sometimes you get marula trees and in other cases it's big leadwoods like this particular tree that is busy holding up the Sun by the looks of it it almost looks as though that Sun has been placed in the boughs of that tree and just left to sit there of course we know it will drop down a little bit and it's approaching the horizon with rapid rate so I would imagine within the next I would say two three minutes it will be down and out and gone from our view but still wonderful to see it is beautiful when you've got a wonderful sunset and it's such a nice time of the day just to stop and sit it's also a great time of the day because we know that a lot of the animals start to get moving that are predators so at this time of the day we will hear things like leopards moving and alarm calls and lions and the various other things that go around and so sunset is a good time to stop it's why a lot of the safari vehicles stop around sunset firstly to enjoy the view but secondly to be able to listen for predators now, I thought I saw a Varose eagle owl but I didn't unfortunately it is just the way a certain tree had a branch in it so down to myself I thought there was I'd been very clever and spotted a Varose eagle owl but unfortunately not so there goes our Sun you can see the horizon right in the distance there it's just starting to dip below that and so we soon are going to lose visual of it there's a brown hooded kingfisher calling in the background and well otherwise it's very still now hashtag safari live Taylor McCurdy Tristan sunset T1 sunset or T2 sunset who should be T1 we'll be T1 on hey Senzo let them be T1 because they started okay okay T2 for me all right so I'm T2 T1 hashtag T1 hashtag T2 hashtag safari live on Twitter or YouTube chat as to who you want to see well which sunset you preferred I personally didn't see Taylor sunset so I wouldn't know the foggiest between the two of them but well we have at least some trees and stuff and I like the trees so I'm gonna go with our sunset plus I'm living it which is quite nice it's a beautiful view from where I am there's actually my brown hooded kingfisher that I was talking about since I don't know if you're gonna be able to see but straight in front of me here on this branch to the left of your sunset is the brown hooded kingfisher that was calling that I was referring to just now and it's perched fairly out in the open whether or not it's going to stay there is anyone's guess at this stage they are birds so this there it is it's calling now so that's it calling up a little bit mm, there it is so straight in your frame there we go so there's our brown hooded kingfisher you can see bright red beak that brownish colored head and then the little bit of blue that they have on them now these guys unfortunately are about to be silenced by the influx of the woodlands kingfisher these guys tend to take a back seat once the woodlands arrived and they only when they depart do we start to see the brown hooded's regularly and hear their call a lot more it seems as though when the woodlands get here they know just to keep quiet it's not worth competing and they leave it to them and then carry on after they leave again so these guys stay all year round whereas the woodlands obviously only here in the summer months beautiful view of one though they're quite tough to get on camera because they generally are a little bit 
sort of flighty they don't like vehicles very much that's the view that I've got down into the Mulawati isn't it beautiful so I'm gonna start meandering into my sunset you can even see our sunset on our bonnet because Taylor McCurdy will be very happy I washed Rusty today and I will be giving Rusty a good polish at some point as well but today he got washed and is now looking all spiffy and clean all right Senzo hold on it's going to be a steep descent into the Mulawati riverbed hopefully we will not damage anything. This is the hill that I was talking about with Wendy and Rusty. Rusty negotiates this like a pro going the other way, whereas Wendy sometimes a little bit of a struggle to get up here. Oopsie. You all right there, Senzo? Good. Okay, there we go. And Rusty is over. Well done, Rusty. So I'll be setting sunset for the win. Woohoo! Well done, guys. Well done, Senzo. High five, buddy. There we go. <laughs> now, of course, it's not really a real competition, and I'm sure Taylor's was just as beautiful, and it's all just a bit of fun and games, just to have a bit of a laugh amongst each other. But at least we won. Of course, we won't let Taylor know that. We're going to just rub it in. When I speak to Taylor next, I'm going to tell her that our sunset was prettier, and that we found a beautiful sunset as well. So... Now I just need to find a leopard and then we can beat her in that too and then they will be really, the cat will be amongst the pigeons and I will be in a lot of trouble probably. So I'm going to slowly, slowly check along Gauri Main now to see if any sign of Hassan are crossing. If there isn't, I'm sure he must be here and I will find him. Uh, like I say, I'm a bit of a dog with a bone when it comes to this, these kind of things. Now these tracks here, I just want to investigate quickly. Hmm baboon tracks all of them so this is where the baboons cross south and i'll show you the track now because it's actually quite a nice one that's on this side if rusty would go into reverse that would help all right senzo so i'm going to park you so that you can see a little bit better but basically just on this sort of edge here um basically coming across there so those ones there is the tracks going over the road and in fact actually no, it is baboon tracks. That's just the hind foot of these baboons. The the proper babo the front foot is further back than that. And you might be wondering why I know it's a back and front foot. Well, the back track of a baboon has that much more elongated shape. And you can see the opposable thumb on the left foot there. So the left foot is the one closest to us. The thumb goes away from our direction at a sort of 45 degree angle. And then the fingers in front. So it's a fairly young baboon, this one. And that's its back foot. On the front foot, you won't have that section towards the back, that pointy section. It will have a, a rounded section. And I'll show you quite exactly what I mean once I find it in my book there we go all right so what you've got there in that track is this particular track over here which is the back foot so that is the baboon track back foot that we see the big one and you can see that V that comes back that opposable thumb that I was talking about and then the long fingers that go off also with the baboons you will find this elongated extra lobe on it then with the vervets the vervets don't quite have a long one like this they tend to have a very short rounded lobe there but the front foot you can see is very different the front foot has this b shape for baboon which is quite nice it helps to be able to understand the track and to know it better and then very long fingers on the front foot as opposed to the back foot and again the opposable thumb and if we have a look at the vervet monkey track that you see on this side so the one that you could confuse it with out here you see even the front foot on the vervet monkey has the v for baboon uh, for vervet and then the baboon one has the b for baboon so that's the front foot there of the vervet and that's the front foot of the baboon up on the top right so it gives you a nice indication of how we're able to track them and this on the left hand side is an actual size of a vervet monkey track this one here is a reduced size so it can be slightly bigger than what we see there so it gives you just an idea of the two monkey tracks that we see now the thing is with these monkeys going southwards it might be a good place to check treehouse dam because maybe Hosanna went northwards maybe he decided I'm gonna get out of these baboons way and head towards treehouse dam we know he does do that quite a bit and we've seen him at treehouse dam there's no sign that I can see of a leopard crossing Gauri Main, anywhere. I've checked the Mulawati, so I think possibly he might be still somewhere in this general vicinity. Oh, now it sounds like Taylor McCurdy is having a reset and is rematching to a second attempt of the sunset. Let's see if she'll have a better outcome, but I don't know if it's in within the rules. 
very, very disappointed in all of you for choosing Tristan's sunset over mine. I don't think I can carry on anymore. I'm just joking. Tristan, you are a rock star, aren't you? You just win at life all the time. Well, congratulations. It was uh, well deserved. I thought we were a shoe in, really. Um, it, you know, it was so spectacular. Now, my initial plan was, of course, to go towards the river. We have since changed our minds. The reason for this is because there's some very dark clouds that have come in all of a sudden and I do not like the look of them. And I would like to go for day number three without having to put my rain covers on. Whether it will be possible, I don't know. But maybe, maybe we'll have some luck here. Oh, there's a, some draft. I'll stop and have a look at them now. Let me just, we'll just try and stop. We have to use the gears again to slow down. Whoa, car. There we go. Made it stop quite gently as well. The other time I did that, I forgot, I took my foot off the clutch too quickly. Almost lost my teeth on the steering wheel. And that would have been very awkward if I had to do my safaris with no teeth. But um, look at that. There's some giraffe. There's some last bit of light sort of catching on the clouds. Uh, it's amazing just how dark it gets, especially with all the clouds around. It's going to get pitch black very quickly. You can just see them moving back towards the escarpment. They've still got quite a way to go. Perhaps they'll settle somewhere in between. And there's an entire journey of them. One, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I think there's about ten or eleven, which is quite cool. And an impala, a little impala lamb as well. Just posing in between the giraffe. Hello, tiny tot. Oh, this one's not too young because mom has brought it back to the herd. The rest of them are just off to the left. And it seems as though there's quite a few youngsters here. So they're probably about three or four weeks old. now. maybe three weeks old. Maybe I'm, I'm aging them too much. Now what would be perfect is if we could get the hyenas to start whooping or a lion to start roaring. I've not seen any lions to, this afternoon, not even a sign of them. But perhaps we'll have to head back towards the lugger, the drainage line that the Yungamas like to hang around. Maybe they're back. We'll go and check it out. A very curious giraffe. She's not having any of it. We've basically got a tail to the face, mister. And off they go. Isn't that beautiful? Look at all the trees in the background. I get excited when I see all those trees from where I'm sitting because they just look like black specks on the open area. And I get, think they're wildebeest. Now, Alex, you're wondering, how do these giraffe not get too much blood in their head when they bend their heads down to drink or eat? Well, it's incredible. So at the base of a giraffe's skull, there is a spongy muscle, essentially. And um, there are lots of blood capillaries. So that blood is, is not being um, pumped to one direct source. It's actually being sort of split up and, and spread out. Um, so this allows them... Um, to not basically get a head rush and, and faint and fall over. So it's a combination of all the capillaries that are around the base of the skull and also that spongy sort of tissue um, that helps alleviate some of the pressure. But it always amazes me because if I look down for too long, I feel lightheaded. So <laughs> um, it's incredible how giraffe are able to do it. But let's carry on. Let's see what else we've got. This is a good road for lions. So you never know what could possibly pop out in front of us. And we're going to start scanning. But it's for now, it's a little bit on the quiet side. But that's okay. We've actually had a very, very nice drive. I thoroughly enjoyed myself this morning. That bumble was spectacular. And, and this afternoon has been very pleasant as well. Very, very nice indeed. Everyone looks like they're going home. Harlow running that way. Giraffe are going this side. Buffalo, well, are trying to not get hit by the impala. Let's see if these little ones are going to jump. They're all racing like rabbits. Oh, we hit the brakes quite hard. Phew, that was a mouthful of a question. I'm going to try and repeat it. I'm probably not going to repeat it accurately. But it's from James, and it's regarding which animals between South Africa and Mara, so in Kenya, um, exhibit the most behavioral 
changes, I think area specific, something along those lines. Oh, that's a tough one. I'm just going to move out the way because as you can see we've got a cloud of dust and I will answer your question with a vehicle coming towards us. So I just want to pull off. I think she's going to angle us slightly because oh, I can't. I don't want to eat the dust. Okay, we're going to do the duck and cover and then I'll get your question, James. Are you ready? Ferg, got to get the jersey out like this. Okay. <laughs> Hello, and duck from the dust. No, I'm joking. It's not actually that bad. I was just being a drama queen. Um, so, oh my god, it's like gr 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 gorillas in the mist, but giraffe in the dust. I don't think we should see any more cars. So, ooh, oh, we're starting again. <laughs> um, so, oh, it's a tough one to, I just have to think about this for a moment to sort of start comparing animals. Um, le let me just quickly think about this. I don't know. The elephant feeding behavior here is quite interesting. Compared to, well, again, that's food. That's, I suppose that's area specific. Hmm. Lions. There we go. I'm, lions are the ones that have really intrigued me the absolute most. So firstly, um, I actually chatted about a little bit about this the other day. Uh, the fact that the lions here, the lionesses, have home ranges, but they have territories too. So they sort of have a... Um, a core territory in the center and then they have a home range that extends further than that and, and because of the high density of, of lion the lionesses have started marking territories and I've never seen that in South Africa and I don't think that there are many guides in South Africa who haven't worked in other areas in Africa have seen something like that so for me James that's probably the most amazing thing unfortunately I haven't had an opportunity to spend much time with leopards and when I have they've really been sleeping or just you know sort of had their heads up not doing any anything um, out of the ordinary that I've noticed. The giraffe, and seeing as though we're sitting with them, no, I haven't noticed anything different. They sort of behave very much like the giraffe in South Africa. Um, so for me, it has to be the lions that are, are, are the most interesting. Oh my goodness, there's even some southern ground hornbills flying. You might see them, they might pop out just on the other side of the giraffe. There we go, you saw the white, there, there they go. And that's a car. Wow, go for a go! Look at that panning skill. Oh, there's the other one. That is beautiful. What perfect timing. Fantastic. Obviously going to find a spot to roost on the river. Maybe they are the same hornbills that woke me up one morning uh, with the dawn chorus when I, oh, there's a third one, when I had a little nap against the Mara River. That was spectacular. That was really lovely. What a lovely scene. You really just don't know what you're going to expect when you're out here. Wow, really every single time I come out on safari and I have days like this that are, you know, the animals are just behaving really well, hello giraffe, hello buffalo, we'll sneak through, I don't want to disturb you. Um, and then having, you know, beautiful, <laughs> I don't know what this giraffe just tried to do. This is quite funny as we went past. It's, um, it looked like it sort of jumped up and tried to kick and buck as if a, a um, horse would, but it didn't work, of course, it's quite long. Um, but yeah, so what I was trying to say is just seeing the dramatic skies, the beautiful sunsets and all the animals and just really trying to take it in. It's, um, it, it's stunning. It really, really is truly magnificent out here. So Tristan seems to... Ooh, sorry, can you please go again, Alice? Oh, oh, there we go. That's exciting. I was just about to say, Tristan, the Leopard King was on the search for leopards, but it seems as though he's found one. Yes, Taylor, we have. And there, look, who's sitting at Trias Dam? So my hunch to come check Trias Dam has paid off with the baboons heading south. The leopard has headed north. And there comes Hosanna, and he's now lying at his other favorite spot, if it's not at Twin Dams, where he lies on the dam wall. Yes, Hardy Die, I know there's a leopard. Thank you very much. You've warned us. You've told us. Thank you. You can keep quiet now. Yes, there we go. Hardy Die is now going to carry on shouting. But Hosanna, is, this is his other favorite spot. He loves this log that has fallen over at Treehouse Dam. So I'm super glad that we came in this direction to come and check for him. So what a wonderful surprise. And the con streak continues. If it, I think if it wasn't for Hosanna, we wouldn't have gone about three days with Arctic Cat, but he has been such a solid performer for us over the last few weeks. We really have been so fortunate in that he's spent a lot of time 
around these dams and he keeps lying right out in the open where it's easy to find him and we've had the best time with this little cat so isn't that a sight for sore eyes and like i say our run continues so taylor unfortunately you've lost the sunset and now you've lost the big cat challenge too so we've really hammered taylor today and we'll have to give her something <laughs> to cheer her up now i'm sure taylor's just fine and we mean it with the utmost jest i really i know what it's like when it's a little bit quiet and i was stressing a little bit because if we came to treehouse and he wasn't here i was really not sure where this cat could have gone to i wasn't 100 percent sure if he may have crossed south but given that i checked south and he wasn't there was no tracks crossing over gari main the only other place he could have gone was either the Mulawati or Treehouse Dam. And luckily for us, there he sits at the dam right out in the open. So what a wonderful surprise it is to see our little boy. He's starting to yawn, which means maybe, just maybe, he might get up and start moving. Hello, big boy. He is looking really good, though. He's busy watching some Egyptian geese that are on the other side of the water hole. That's what he was watching moving around. You can see... Imagine having a noisy neighbor like the hardy doll all the time. In fact, I can imagine that because where I used to live in Johannesburg, those hardy dolls used to land on my windowsill and cry like that at 4 o'clock in the morning. And it was not very pleasant. So I can sympathize with you, Hosanna. I know that shouting and that wah every two seconds like that is not that pleasant. So I'm pretty sure Hosanna will hope that it keeps quiet. Now, what he might want is the Egyptian geese to come round. <laughs> so Taylor McCurdy is saying that her feelings are hurt and that she's going to adopt the fetal position and cry herself to sleep tonight. Taylor McCurdy, there's no need for that at all. We are just joking. And if anybody can find a cat on the way home, it will be Taylor Mac. And I'm pretty sure she's going to get something epic to make up for her day. But I think Hassan is going to stalk this Egyptian goose. There's an Egyptian goose that is slowly walking in this direction. His eyes are fixed on it and he's just bowing his head down below and watching the Egyptian goose. So there's the Egyptian goose right there. And oh, Egyptian goose has decided, no, hang on, there's something not right. I'm going to change my mind and move off. Now, a leopard will hunt an Egyptian goose. I have seen Tundi's youngest cub, Wabi Yuza, grab an Egyptian goose once at Chitra Dam. So they do go after them from time to time. And you can see there's a big sigh as if to say, come on, Egyptian goose, come closer, don't walk away. And the Egyptian goose is not listening at all now also taylor mccurdy's got nothing to complain about now that i'm thinking about it sorry my my little hamster takes a while to catch up on its wheel it sometimes turns a little slower than it should but she's got nothing to complain about i do believe last night she saw two bat-eared foxes now i'm very envious in that she's gotten to see bat-eared fox she's also been seeing the cheetahs regularly so she's got really no reason to complain and no reason to be crying herself to sleep she's having a wonderful time that side and seen so many amazing things judging by the instagram posts and the photos that i've seen on her pages she seems to be having a really really good time and seen a lot of amazing things so you know she's she's also not doing too badly herself and while we have been lucky with leopards it's not always going to be this way oh, big yawn I think he's going to start thinking about moving. I think you're going to see a bit of grooming happening. Then I think he's going to start waking up and heading maybe hopefully down for a drink. Imagine if he comes down to drink and this light will just put a bit of light on him and it will be beautiful with the reflection because Treehouse Dam is still, 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 still. The wind has dropped completely. There's the odd insect that is busy hatching. Lots of mosquitoes around. In fact, when we got into Rusty this afternoon, it was like a cloud coming out of it. There was all the mosquitoes from last night. And so there will be a few insects that are hatching off the water surface, but otherwise it is like glass. And if he comes to drink, we're going to get a beautiful reflection of Hosanna drinking. And hopefully he comes to a nice flat section across from us or maybe on this other side where the Egyptian geese are and has a drink before he starts his evening of moving around. Now talking about mosquitoes, I've even got two mosquitoes mating right next to me on my jersey. Do not mate on my jersey. I don't want mosquito larvae laid anywhere near me. Off you go. Who does that? I think we've timed this perfectly. I think if we'd got you earlier, it'd probably be quite a sleepy cat. So I think we've gotten here just the right time to see a bit of activity. Now, where he's going to go from here is going to be interesting. He's done a big kind of northward push to Biffles Hook Dam and then went south to Twin Dams. And now he's back here. So it's going to be interesting where he's going to go. 
Proud Cat Mama, happy birthday. I hope that you're having a wonderful day. You say thank you for finding a leopard on your birthday. Well, it's my absolute pleasure. I hope that you enjoy it and I hope that you're having a wonderful day or continue to have, or have had a wonderful day, should I say, and continue to have a wonderful day further. And it is nice always when you have a leopard on your birthday and hopefully I will be lucky this year and have a leopard on my birthday. It's always the animal I look for on my birthday. I don't know why I like looking for them and sometimes I get lucky, sometimes I do don't. Now the rest of your question I've completely forgotten because I got so excited about your birthday and was <laughs> too busy wishing you. So I know you said something about territory but I didn't actually pick it up all. So Lou if you can repeat that. Ah, does the tail for a leopard have any specific uses? So yes, the tail is used quite a lot with a leopard, particularly when climbing. It just offsets the balance and it just helps to keep that cat straight when it's going up trees and especially when it's hoisting carcasses. You can imagine carcasses swing and their weight throws the leopard off a little bit and that tail will constantly move when climbing around to help with that. So they really do use their tail effectively for that. Also it will help a little bit with hunting. Look, he's watching a giraffe in the distance. There's a giraffe He's got his head over the log, and then in the distance, you'll just see the head of a giraffe. There, you see it walking on the horizon. So Hosanna is watching the giraffe with a very lazy look. Now, I wonder if this giraffe is going to come down the bank towards him. But it's just so funny to see how he's watching the giraffe. It's about as lazy a look as you could have. He's got his head resting perfectly. There we go. Is that the best way to see it? <laughs> Isn't he a cute cat sometimes? But the giraffe will come down and hopefully have a drink as well. It's really nice to see so many giraffe around. There's lots of tracks for them again and we haven't seen many giraffe and I think it's because of all the flowering bush willows. So the giraffe are coming back to feed off those, much like what we were discussing with the elephants earlier. And Hosanna's just watching it. Of course, that's not a meal for Hosanna. Hosanna, even though he is a male leopard, He's not a fully grown male leopard, and that is a massive giraffe. That is not a small giraffe by any stretch of the imagination. It looks like a young male, so I highly doubt that giraffe is going to be on the menu, even for a big male leopard. We know that Tingana and Anderson have both brought down fairly hefty giraffe, but he's still got a long way to go before he's that size and is able to do such things. So the giraffe for him, unfortunately, will just be a figment of his imagination and a pipe dream for later in life. You're far better off with the Egyptian goose, Hosanna, than you are with the giraffe. The giraffe is going to hurt you if you go after that, but can't help but look and ponder. Imagine, I would imagine he sits there almost looking at it like a big steak. You know, when you're hungry and you go past somewhere and you see some really nice food and he's kind of salivating at this massive giraffe that's walking past. He is such a beautiful cat, though. So a lot of you are commenting that I am truly the leopard whisperer. No, I I don't think so. I, like I said, I've just been so lucky. It's the time of the year as well. I'm on my own here at Juma. So, you know, if, if there had been other vehicles here, let's say Taylor or Ali or Byron, they would have taken routes that I might have driven to have found some of these cats and they would have had a lot of the sightings on their own. So the fact that I'm on my own has helped with me being able to see a lot of leopards and, and to have gone to a lot of the sightings that are around. That coupled with the fact that it's dry season, water is, is a requirement and, and particularly Hosanna and Tumba, they seem to like to hang around water and I've just really, it's just been luck. It's it's not, I mean, we've, we've tracked the odd one, but it's not been in any way, you know, that much of my kind of skill. It's, it's just, I've been lucky at the end of the day and any one of the other presenters that had been here over this period would have also seen just as many leopards and and would have really had just a special sighting. So it's it's... It's just a lucky thing and, and I suppose the, the positive vibes do help and, and putting out positive thoughts and spending time looking for them, you sometimes do get rewarded. But at the end of the day, any one of the presenters at Safari Live has both the luck and the skill to pull off sightings a plenty of any of these cats. And so I w would imagine that any one of them would have seen these guys. It's it's like I say, I mean, it's it's one of those things. And, and in fact, actually, a lot of that goes down to my cameramen. The cameramen have, between Seb and Senza, I've been so spoiled with the two of them because they've really spotted a lot of these cats for me. They've helped me a lot with spotting in areas that I might not have looked. They've got a different perspective to what I do, and they really have been a huge help. And it just goes to show how valuable it is to have guys that are really into it. So not just looking at a camera and thinking about just filming, but are really into actually kind of looking for things and being an extra pair of eyes for us so they also need to take a lot of credit for what goes on they they really are both of them very 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 enthusiastic about what we do and spotting animals and 
they love it just as much as what I do. And, and you know, Seb seems to be have a firm favorite in the leopards. I know Senzo is a lion man, and I've been shoving leopards down his throat for the whole week. But I think it's starting to grow on him. I, I think he's starting to enjoy finding the leopards because he was quite excited when we saw Asana just now at the dam. He was he's kind of exclaimed leopard. So, you know, they go. They need a lot of credit to those guys. They really do help me a lot. So, thank you guys. Thank you, Senzo. You're a champion. Ah, take care. You, you're asking how far does a leopard, sorry Senzo, that's my fault. I just took my foot off the brake. Um, but how far does a leopard's claws go into a tree when it's climbing up? Depends, take care, on the, on the type of tree. So some trees are denser woods than others and therefore claws sometimes don't go as deep as they should. Also depends on the leopard. If you've got a situation where you've got um, a young cub, its claws are going to be nowhere as big as then somebody like Tingana. So the bigger the claws, obviously the deeper and, and also the more powerful the animal and the heavier the animal, the deeper those claws tend to go in the, in the ability to get traction and get up. So you'll find with the male leopards, they'll go in, I would say probably, if I think about Tingana's claws that I saw the other day, maybe at most five, six millimeters, um, not too deep, it's not as deep as you would think. Remember that a lot of these trees have bark on them and so they're actually gripping onto the bark and pulling little bits of bark and the claw itself doesn't go that deep into the wood. Um, but in the really soft woods, I think the deepest I've ever seen is probably just over a centimeter and that was in a very soft wooded tree. It was in a marula that was quite young and, and had been exposed by elephants stripping the bark and the wood was really primed for a leopard to climb. It's also summer when there's a lot more moisture content and the wood tends to be slightly softer so there was a lot of that. Now we are being currently absolutely overrun by mosquitoes. This is the first night since we've been out and about and the summer kind of temperatures have arrived that we've had mosquitoes but they are everywhere. I can see clouds of them all around me so hopefully we don't get hammered by them. They are one of the un insects that really does like to go after me. So look at Hosanna. There goes the Egyptian geese. With longing eyes he's watching the Egyptian geese fly off. I'm sorry my boy that they didn't want to be your friends. Well, You didn't want to be their friend either. You wanted to eat them and make dinner out of them. So he's kind of longingly looking at these Egyptian geese just disappearing into the distance. But how beautiful is Treehouse Dam. It really is a wonderful place to view leopards. It's open, it's clear. There's some nice tall trees around it and we often get that setting sun. What have you seen? Oh, there's Nyala, there's Nyala, there's Nyala, wait, 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 there's Nyala just on our right hand side that are coming. He's not, they've not seen him, but he's watching them. Look, he's just trying to slink under the branch. Now, the Nyala have seen something and they're a bit unsure, but there they are coming down. So this is why he's hanging around dams lately. He's getting a lot of opportunities to hunt. Now, if he's just clever and he keeps his head down and he stays still and keeps his tail from moving, he might just have a chance here. That Nyala knows something's up because he moved. He saw, that Nyala saw some movement and wasn't sure what was going on. But he's now got himself right up against the log and I can promise you in the light that we've got at the moment, it is very difficult to see him. Although, those Nyala are looking intently in his direction. So there he is. Look at how he's blending. Even with the camera, it's becoming difficult to see him. So this dark, dingy light is really not easy to see and he's going to have to hope that he sits dead still and exercises the patience that he did a few days ago when we saw him hunting those impalas and to lay very low not to make any noise or any movement just to sit and wait until the nyala are satisfied that there's nothing there but that is pretty cool to see so we might have sort of hunt 2.0 from the other afternoon and i was saying that this is a good time because he's going to start getting active it's also been a warm day which means these nyala need to come and drink and they're unsure you can see the two at the back um, haven't noticed him and now even the female she's kind of saw something but she's not sure now Hosanna has actually creeped a little bit closer and he's waiting for them to go down to drink just be patient boy she's definitely aware something is here but that is the distance between them at the moment it's not very far so he's on the far left of that screen you can see you can hardly see him in this light he's completely hidden that spotted coat is blending in so well and then the Nyala notice some sort of movement and they're just watching but look at him he's in that exact same position that we saw him with the impalas flat low to the ground now he needs to just be patient and wait for them to all commit to drinking before he decides to move any further now slowly but surely they are coming down to drink 
and in fact they have started drinking you can see he's popping his head up now he's getting ready to try and position himself again once all the heads go down and they're drinking he can then move and try and work out a way to get closer but at the moment he's just watching and checking there we go you see he's trying to creep the Nyala are drinking now so they're all heads down but he doesn't really have much to work with here he's unfortunate that the Nyala have drank where they have hopefully for him once they finish drinking they walk towards him that's his only option that he's got um, otherwise he's going to have a bit of a tough time of it because where he is currently is not great at all and also I want to try and take my light off him because I don't want those Nyala to see so I'm sorry if it gets a little bit darker but I don't want that look there he's crawling so he's into that leopard crawl again. Now, leopards have different collarbones to other animals. And then they have a floating collarbone. And that allows them basically to push their tummy right down onto the ground. Push their hips up. And they can then crawl on their tummy and keep their profile low. But this Nyala knows something's not quite right. It's much like the Impalas the other day. This Nyala is aware that, hang on a second, there is something that keeps kind of catching my eye. I'm not sure what it is. But she is definitely unsure. Now, come If these Nyala move around the dam and head closer towards where Hosanna is, they're going to be in a lot of trouble because he's going to have the, the run on them. But I don't think they will. I think they're going to go back the way they came. Yep, that female is very nervous. She knows, hang on, something's not right here. I'm going to go back the way I came. That's the safest route. And there they go up the bank. Now, whether Hosanna is going to follow is going to be interesting. Although she's turning. I wonder where she's going to go. I cannot believe how many mosquitoes are around us though. It is quite phenomenal to see them. There is clouds and clouds and clouds of them. I'm sorry that it's very dark. We don't have our IR on just yet. We haven't had time to put it on and unfortunately I don't want to shine lights on him or the Nyala so I know it is a little bit on the dark side but please bear with us. We'll try and put our lights on once the Nyala have left and we'll be able to then see him a little bit better. But the Nyala are clever. They're going exactly the route they've come knowing that that's a safe place that they've come from. So now I can put on my light again and just give him a bit more sort of color because they've drifted away. So they are no longer even facing him. He's going to have to try and find himself a better place to try and stalk. And maybe once they go around the corner and they drift off into the thicket, he might then start to pursue them. Sorry, my boy, it didn't quite work out for you. You were close again, but had the, had the idea again. It's just he's got to hope for that they come a little bit closer to drink than what they did, unfortunately. I wouldn't be surprised. I'm sure of that we are going to find Hosanna on a kill at one of these dams within the next week. I'm pretty sure about it. He's learning valuable lessons every time and he is starting to work out that this is where he needs to be in the afternoons. And it's why we're finding him a lot at these dams is because in the afternoons he knows animals come to drink, particularly in warm weather, and this is the best place to be is to sit in these dams, wait and watch, and soon things come. Now what have you spotted above you? He's kind of looking up into the trees to see what's going on. So Senzo is going to go into IR, so you'll see the color will go away. We'll go black and white, and it will help us see a lot better. There we go. That's going to be a lot better. Now, unfortunately, we don't have the IR light, so it will still be a little bit kind of noisy. But once we have a chance to put the IR light on, it will be much better. Yawning, which means that, again, I think he is going to move. Hopefully, it is to come drink. That would be ideal. Although, at this stage, it seems as though he's still contemplating which way he's going to go in order to hunt his Nyala. Christine, you're saying Hosanna is such a patient boy. He is, isn't he? I've been absolutely amazed by the patience he's shown over the last little bit. He's really matured as an individual. He's no longer that little boy that kind of rushes out and tries to go after anything and chase everything. He's working out techniques day by day and he seems to be getting a lot more successful with how he's approaching hunting he seems to have worked out that dams are the way to go at the moment that there's lots of food items that are coming down towards water holes and that if he uses the banks and the undulating terrain of these water holes that there is a chance that he can hunt and that he needs to just be patient and the time will come he might have 10 hunts like this where he misses and he doesn't even get to chase but there will be a day where they're going to come straight towards him and he's going to have them right on his basically his doorstep and he'll be able to grab one so this is all great training even though that 
you can't constitute as a proper hunt he's just stalked and he's working out so it's a lesson that has been learned from what he's just done it wasn't actually a hunt and, and a failure it's it's more a lesson he didn't really have much of a chance given how open it was between him and the nyala so he did the best he could and that's okay he like i say he's going to have gleaned valuable information from that and will learn in terms of how to hunt around treehouse the next time he's here so really good to see and 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 he's fast becoming a very clever little cat and streetwise is probably the way i would describe him and maybe that being on his own and having the mother that he's had really has prepped him to be the way he is you can see he's being driven mad by the mosquitoes just as much as we are he's biting about and sort of lashing out at them scratching so i think he's having his own mosquito problems that we are having as well this side of the world Kimberly, you hope that Hosanna gets some supper soon. Well, I think he's still feeding. I mean, at the end of the day, he's not emaciated by any stretch of the imagination. So I think he's catching smaller mammals at night. So things like scrub hares and varying other smaller mammals that we see, things like Steenbok maybe, um, even tortoises he'll go after, the odd terrapin, maybe birds in between all of that. So I think he's sustaining himself on those. But yes, it would be really nice for him to grab himself a big impala like he had the, when I started uh, a few weeks ago back from leave when he had that impala in the tree close to treehouse dam that would be ideal and first prize for Osana that's what I would really hope that he got and there's no better place to do it than at these water holes so between here and twin dams it's going to come he will find one at some point and when he does hopefully we'll be here to find it or to film it at least and see him with his dinner it would be really nice to come around the corner and have him up in a tree with a big impala Isn't he beautiful though? Now unfortunately our Mara girls have got no signal at the moment so you're going to be with me and enjoy Hosanna for longer. Uh, Palin, the biggest thing that I've ever seen a leopard catch is a two-year-old giraffe which was massive so that was Tingana that caught that um, with Moya. He was mating with Moya and he managed to uh, catch a two-year-old giraffe which was really a massive massive meal I've got a photo of it somewhere I will try and find it somewhere for you and, and be able to show you exactly what I'm talking about um, so that's the biggest the smallest termites so I've seen it leopards feeding off winged alits which is the smallest thing so between the two they will go after both now he seems to be interested in something else I wonder if there's something else that is approaching this area and Oh, there's a diker. So he's stalking a diker now. There's a diker straight in front of me that's coming down for water as well. So it's just on the edge of a thicket and it's slowly but surely making its way down towards the water as we speak. So, so you will have a little bit, unfortunately, of darkness because of the lights that's gone off and will be in infrared. But like I said, we don't have our infrared light, so it's not going to be 100%. But we'll still be able to see what goes on. The diker is heading straight towards me and it's hopefully going to come out of a thicket. Right now we won't see much of it because it's just behind a bush but it should be slowly but surely coming down to drink and have water and so hopefully that's what's going to happen and Hosanna will be able to stalk the diker. You can see though there's opportunity abounding from every direction at the moment and it'll be interesting to see where the diker has gone because I can't see it now. It was moving up towards the thicket again uh, I've lost it completely I'm not sure where it's gone but it was directly in front of me in a little grassy patch I just saw its head bobbing around but now I can't see it at all Senzo can you see it not yet so it seems as though maybe it's gone across the road the way that Hosanna's is looking looks as though he's looking north of the dam at the moment so I wonder if he isn't just checking up that way Okay, so there we go. There's a light. So Senzo has done a quick fix and he's holding the IR light so that we can see her much better at night. Well done, Senzo. That's a sterling effort that you're busy doing there. It's not easy to hold a camera and a light, but he's doing it so that we can see a lot better and we can actually film what go takes place and what goes on. If you want, Senzo, I can hold the light for you if you want to be able to. Okay, so he says he's all right. Now, it seems as though Hosanna has lost interest just a little bit and is not paying as much attention to that dike. I think it's because it's not coming down for water 
I think he's decided that he's not too concerned at this stage. But you see, he's still at least aware that there are things around. Look at those ears listening. There we go. Now he's starting to go. I think he's going to start creeping up back towards where where that diker went. Just giving himself a little bit of height just to see what's going on. And it is amazing. I cannot see a single thing now. It is just literally a blur on the other side of the bank. It's only because I know where he is that I can see him. Otherwise, he's completely blending in. But with the IR, we're able to see it really is quite amazing. And look how big he's getting. He's getting nice tall legs now. He's getting really quite large. Are you going to sit on your stump? Nope. A little unsure, I think, what he wants to do at this stage. I don't know if he wants to leave the dam or if he wants to hunt the diker that was around or go back after the Nyala or where he wants to go. But he's sitting and listening and looking and I think he's hoping that something's going to come drink and he can use the cover of darkness to hunt from the edge of this water. That's what I think he's hoping for. I wonder if that's not how he killed the Impala here last time. Is that the, the one that we saw in the tree that he dragged it from the dam side. So maybe he knows if he's just patient here at night, something will arrive and he will have that opportunity to hunt and have it in his advantage by it being here at night and just spending time so maybe he knows just to be patient and not to go wandering off into the bush and attract attention to himself by chasing things that are not really there to be chased and rather wait and be patient and let things come to him seems like a good strategy anyway right now I'm going to try and get my IR working correctly I believe Jamie has found some signal and not only that but two very interesting round-eared creatures Ah, oh, we're back once again and we've got a lovely surprise. We've battled off the gremlins and we've come across some bat-eared foxes. I'll be dying to put bat-eared foxes on camera, especially when Taylor had such a wonderful sighting last night. And there they go, trotting off into the darkness. Oh, my goodness. Have I got caffeine shakes or something? Stay still, Spotlight. There they go, off on their night hunting expedition, off in search of insects. They are, of course insectivores so they're off searching for insects I really I, it takes me back to my days working in the Kalahari in the green Kalahari we used to see bat-eared foxes all the time and we had den sites and little babies and such amazing little creatures they usually relax quite quickly but these two are very very skittish we're very far away from them here you go hi guys an enormous number of teeth. Flat-eared boxes. Off they go. Trotting into the darkness. Bye guys. I'll try it. Let me let me try and reposition. It's gonna be a bit shaky. They will have to deal with it. It's just one of those things. We've got this amazing camera that lets us view the animals at night. But it doesn't zoom back far enough for you to see the back of my head, so we apologize if you get motion sick. Oh, please don't disappear, signal. I'm definitely going downhill. Wait up! Oh, I've lost them. Oh, there they are. There they are. Let's try to keep some distance. There we go managed to find them again so I'm having to use because of the distance that we're at I'm having to use my spotlight to help us see them they're naturally quite inquisitive creatures and they have as I said an enormous number of teeth funnily enough we used to play peekaboo with them and they used to run into the road and and turn the lights on and then turn the lights off Stevie you say what a great sighting they are they are definitely thoroughly enjoyable little creatures they're so entertaining you know we've got a lot of time that we're going to spend here in the Mara if we could find a bat-eared fox den and sit there and habituate them that would be something really special get them used to us 
I know Brent did find one. That's something that we should think about when we have slightly more time on our hands. Go and sit and spend time with the bat-eared foxes. Hey, what do you guys think of that? Let's go over to Hosanna. Well, it seems Hosanna is stalking something, so we can just see a light when, of an eye in the grass. I think it's a scrub here that he's stalking. Yes, there's the scrub here, and he is probably about five meters to the left of it, just behind that tree. So there is a tree there that has got a black mark on it, which is the time-lapse clip for Seb, and he is somewhere in that thicket between those trees. So if you do see the black sort of square, that is for t Seb to do his time lapses, but there's Hosanna there. You can just see the back of his tail and he's kind of prepping himself to almost jump. So we'll stay on the scrub here for now because he's slowly but surely stalking his way towards that scrub hair. And this is the kind of thing that he will go after. Remember we were saying that he'll feed off things like scrub hairs to sustain himself between the big meals like impalas. So he's definitely stalking that and I wonder if he's not going to sneak his way a little bit closer and that scrub hair is going to be caught unawares. Let's see. Interesting though that he picked it up. It was amazing. He was just sitting there and he all of a sudden picked up something and just started moving that way and then the scrub bear has just popped out now and hopefully the scrub bear moves towards Hosanna and we see him chasing it because it'll be amazing. We know that he has caught a scrub here in the last week so I'm pretty sure he does go after them quite regularly and I've had a very close encounter with a scrub here in Hosanna and fortunately he missed that day but let's see maybe he's going to get a little closer. It's interesting. There's the eyes of the scrub here. Now of course there's no lights on whatsoever so we can't see anything in the dark. I can't see where he is or the scrub here. It's only through the monitor that I can watch what's going on. So hopefully for Hosanna he just sits tight where he is and the little scrub here comes bounding towards him around that mound. Which I don't know if it's going to do. The road is on the other side there and we know the scrub here is like to be in open clearings. They don't really like to go through thickets but it seems, maybe it seems as though it's coming closer. Is it coming closer? It does look like it's coming straight towards us, doesn't it? Which means it's going to make its way straight towards Hosanna. Nope. There, it's turning now. No. Can't see him at all. I don't know where he's gone, but he's somewhere behind that clump of trees. Is he still there? Oh, there he is. You can just see him. Look at that camouflage. Isn't that amazing? So he's going to just lower himself probably and start to creep again. The thing about a scrub here is it's a fleet-footed animal and it's fast. And out of all the animals out here that see well at night, scrub hares are one of them. So scrub hares also do see very well. And so he's got to be a little bit aware of that. And, and that's why he's taking his time. It's about patience. And this is what he has to learn as a leopard. As a leopard is an ambush predator. It's not a rushing predator like a cheetah or a lion in those sort of regards it's it's more an ambush it needs to wait it needs to hold tight and wait for that exact opportunity there now the scrub has moved a little bit you see how careful he is with his feet placing them delicately and and ever so quietly making sure he's not making noise and you'll find the back leg if he takes another step will go exactly where that front leg went so he's going to direct register he's going to make sure that he's not making too much noise by moving and he keeps his feet moving in the same like you see see how carefully he places that back foot right where that front foot was and he ever so gently places his front foot there we go see how he's watching look at how that back foot comes down slowly i think maybe the scrub here has run off a little bit because his movement has quickened slightly like i said i can't see anything i have no idea where the scrub here has gone i've got no lights at all so difficult for me to see what's happening. Okay, I can see the scrub here now. So the scrub here is just to the right, Senzo, just in the open clearing there. Uh, somewhere in that general vicinity I saw it. I don't know, somewhere there. So Mary, you say he's definitely going to catch something for dinner tonight. Well, I hope so. He's certainly trying his luck with everything that is around. So I'm sure at some point... He is going to grab something. I'm sure I saw that scrub here out on that open clearing somewhere. Maybe it was just my eyes deceiving me. 
Hmm, interesting. Nonetheless, I thought I saw it there. Either the way, it must be somewhere close that he's kind of moving along that thicket. Can you see him still, Senzo? Is he still behind the tree? It's difficult to make them out when they're behind thickets like this. Yes, there he is. He's at the back there. So I'm just going to try and watch him more than the scrub here because the scrub here is going to move around and he's going to sort of trot and jump and kind of run around a little bit. And so if we watch him, we'll be able to keep up with what is going on. What I want to try and do is just get a slightly better angle on this because we're not going to disturb the hunt too much from where I am. I'm right across the dam on the other side, so I just want to go up onto the dam wall itself, and we shouldn't have any issues if we go onto the dam wall. We should have a situation where we're able to kind of still view the process, but have a much better, clearer view with him behind that thicket as we speak. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to get that side. Now a mosquito bit me on the nose, and it's super itchy. And now it's really... <laughs> The first time I've ever been bitten on the nose before, it's <laughs> driving me a little bit on the mad side, I must be honest. It's a very unusual feeling to have an itchy nose via mosquito bite. So I do apologize if I sneeze at any stage. It's because of this silly little sort of nose that I've got of my at the moment. So there I can see him. Can you see him, Senzo? So we're going to try and just watch him for a little bit longer and see how close he is. Look, there he's stalking. How cool is that? With the infrared and his lights glowing as he's stalking down towards the water. Look at how he's slowly but surely making his way, checking his movement every now and then. Where's the scrub here? I don't see it. It's somewhere here. The way he's stalking, he can see the scrub here. I honestly have no idea where it is. It must be somewhere in this little clearing. But I think let's carry on with him. We would normally be wrapping the show now, but we're going to extend just to watch Hosanna hunting and try and see if he doesn't catch himself a meal. The way he's walking and stalking, how cool is that? It's just that much more sort of hectic with his eyes glowing. It's so much more airy. Imagine that stalking you in the night and you saw that coming. It's enough to make people have nightmares. But so cool. Look how he's just focus his muscles are twitching as he watches and stares and looks i don't know how far he's got to go i seriously can't see the scrub here oh there it is is it not here at the bottom senzo down here right at, to the right to the right other way other way there it is there's the scrub here so it's up against the bank and he's got an opportunity now the scrub here is obscuring itself with that branch so he can then stalk you can see he's got a long way to go though to get anywhere near and it's completely open so it's not like he's hidden but he's going to try he's going to try and keep coming and keep using that to be able to see in this infrared light the way that the eyes catch it and they glow a little bit really helps for us to be able to track both of them so we can see the scrub here on the bottom right leopard on the on the top left and hopefully he's going to slowly but surely make his way down towards this area how cool is this so coming up onto this dam wall certainly seems like a better option. There he comes, slowly but surely. And you can see the light doesn't affect him in any way whatsoever. He's not com blinded by it. We're not showing him. The scrub hair can't see him. He, we can't um, affect the scrub hair so they can't see Hosanna. And so everybody is kind of at their natural state. And it is amazing to watch it in this way. The scrub hair is still feeding down below. He's got no idea there's a leopard stalking it. It's better that way, scrub here. You can see the scrub is just feeding. It has no clue that this leopard is coming and what's lurking behind it. Like I said, stuff nightmares are made of. Glowing eyes in the darkness coming towards you. I think many a child would be creeped out by that. And of course, for us, this is just so exciting. So hopefully, he's going to just cover that ground. And where the scrub here is is perfect for him in a way because the scrub here is behind a little bush. And it's kind of hopping up towards us now. Behind these little bushes are not the worst places because the sauna can use that as cover from the scrub here. And you can see the scrub here is basically going from little tuft of grass to little tuft of grass as it tries to kind of feed during the night. And perfect. Look, here comes Osana. You can see he's using that cover now of darkness to head in that direction. The scrub here's ears are not going to be working as well when it's feeding. It's going to be rustling in the grass. It's not going to be making... It's going to be making a bit of noise. You see the scrub has now noticed something. Hang on. What's going on? No. Nope. Here comes Hosanna again. He's seen that the scrub is not watching. And he's going to slowly come in this direction. The problem is he's got to go uphill now to grab that scrub here. 
If he can get behind that little bush and wait for the scrub bear to come to the left, he might be in business here. Do you see how he waits for the scrub bear to put its head down before he takes a step? But look at that. That is just patience and control. At the end of the day, this leopard, his tail, his everything... He's twitching, he's, ex he's excited, but he's controlling every little bit of that as he stalks towards the scrub hare. And it is an exercise in complete patience and how a leopard goes about its business. We all think that cats and stalking is easy and that these guys have it quite easy when they stalk. But you can see how much patience, how much exercise, how much energy is put in. And you see how he's working it out. He's trying to work out, oh, the scrub hare is listening. So I'm going to stay there now. Just wait for the scrub bear to feed. And he's frozen. Look. He knows now a movement might give him away. Oh, the scrub bear's back feeding. The scrub bear's also aware of something. It's like, mm, I don't know so much if everything's okay here. Much like the Nyala earlier. But it's, as soon as it feeds again, that gives Hosanna the opportunity to move. How cool is this? No, here comes this is really the scrub is running straight towards us. It's it's right next to the vehicle at this stage. There's Hosanna, there's the vehicle. So our lights are completely off. I can't see either one of them right now, but literally the scrub here is running straight towards my tire and Hosanna is just below on the bottom of the damn wall at the moment. And it's a bit of a chess game right now, so we're gonna see who's going to move where next hopefully the scrub here comes to that patch of grass on the left of the screen and goes towards it to feed and then Hosanna can just use that thicket to come around and then maybe launch an attack from there but it doesn't look like it it looks like almost the scrub here is going to come under our car instead don't come this way scrub here no toilet time when being stalked there we go that's what I was saying if he goes into those thickets and Hosanna can use the edge of the dam come around and use those long grassy areas to his advantage Come on. There we go. So you see now he's already starting to move in the background. He's starting to work out. Hang on a second. I've got an opportunity as soon as it goes into the thicket to be able to move. Amazing, isn't it? There he comes. See him moving now in the background? Kimberly, you say if Hosanna can get there, it's just a bound and he's got his dinner. I know it. it's so much patience he's got to exercise to get there that's the problem and look at him how he's positioning his feet slowly and watching moving ever so quietly hoping the scrub here doesn't see him where's the scrub here gone i've lost the scrub here oh there it is it's just on the left side there so scrub here on the left hosana on the right he's getting closer i wonder if he's going to launch his attack soon it's tantalizingly close now, unfortunately, we can't hear him walking. He's making absolutely no sound whatsoever. He is trying to keep as low profile as is possible. You see now he's watching it going down. He's positioning himself to ready to pounce. Look, the back legs are loaded. they down. You see how the bum is going downwards? He's basically, it's like loading a spring-loaded machine. So he's getting that so that he can do this big pounce over the top and then rush towards that scrub here. No, he's decided just a little far, he's going to come around the grass instead. That's the way to do it, Osana. Hopefully he doesn't end up in triage dam. There we go. There we go. No, he missed it. He unfortunately slipped down the bank and into the water and the scrub here got away. Oh no, sorry boy, not only did you miss your dinner, but you got wet as well. Oh no. Anyway, that was just so cool. <laughs> We're being spoiled by this young man. He's let us have the most epic stalking sightings the last few days so close yet so far but how cool was that so 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 special wow <laughs> shame boy did you get a little wet as well on your way down unfortunately he's missed dinner so i think what we're going to do is probably wrap it up there we stayed a little bit longer just to see how that would all play out and with the scrub here departing the scene and running off into the distance and Hosanna looking a little bit bewildered we are probably going to start then our heading home and try and come back in the morning and see where he's gone I don't think he'll be here in the morning I think he'll probably head off somewhere else but you never know 
Now, unfortunately, like I say, it is that time to say goodbye. I know Taylor and Jamie, who are in the Masai Mara, they've had an absolutely wonderful afternoon that side, and they've had uh, tried to get as much signal as possible, and hopefully they'll combat their gremlins as they go along and, and have a good evening. But from myself and Senzo, we've had an absolutely fantastic afternoon. It's been elephants, we've had leopard, giraffe. It just really couldn't have been any better whatsoever. So from myself and Senzo and Lou in Final Control and Megan, it's been an absolute pleasure. We'll see you tomorrow on the Sunrise Safari. Thank you.